Street. All right. I see it's recording and we have uh, a quorum. So I will go ahead and call the May 20th planning board meeting to order. Welcome everybody. Um, there was a little bit of a glitch uh, in getting this meeting started. So um, actually I did, get, <laughs> I did get word that somebody would like to speak before the AMPS section. So I might go ahead and um, we'll do public participation, but then um, maybe reopen public participation after AMPS for anyone who didn't get a chance, who couldn't make it on on time uh, and or who you know, wasn't speaking to AMPS. So, but since we, I know we have somebody in the public out there that would like to comment on that, um, we'll go ahead and break the public participation into two. Uh, and with that, um, remember to put PB in front of your name if you haven't. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jean to uh, give us the uh, meeting procedures. Great, thanks. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, good, because I it's showing up gray for me. So I don't know what's going on. This is just, things are a little odd tonight. So thank you so much for bearing with us. And um, it is good to see that um, members of the community have found um, the link, even with our um, little bit of trouble in having a switch on the, on the link. So tonight for our meeting of the City of Boulder Planning Board, um, we have a few rules for um, these virtual meetings. Any activities that disrupt, dis delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. And just as if we were meeting in person, there's a, a specific time for public comment and open comment. And either I or the board chair will um, uh, acknowledge uh, community members during the open comment or during the public hearing or the applicants and um, indicate, we'll be able to unmute you. And, um, indicate when you can speak. Um, we would request that anyone intending to address the board, please use a full name. And when you do address the board, please include your um, name, and, name and address for the record. Um, no video will be permitted except for board staff and applicants. All others will participate by voice only. I don't think, did my slide advance? Okay, everything's moving slow today. Um, and um, we would like to just have the chat function to be used for technical issues to communicate with me. Um, if you can't get to the raise hand function, we can't have any kind of extra commentary or questions about the matters at hand in the chat because it's kind of like a side conversation that um, doesn't work for staff and, and board members and um, isn't allowed in our meeting rules. And then um, just the sharing of screens, um, it will be by staff um, and applicants. I do, I do have one slide here for, um, to let folks know if you would like to speak during the public hearing, during either the open comment or the public hearing at that appropriate time, you should be able to find the raise hand function. If you go down to the hover at the bottom um, and see participants, and then there's, a, there's three little dots, you should be able to see a raise hand function with that. So, um, and if, if, if you've got a different version of Zoom, sometimes raise hand is right, right available at the bottom, or you can use an Alt Y for, on a PC or an Alt um, Option Y on a Mac. All right, I think that's it. Great, thank you so much, Jean. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I'm going to go ahead then and uh, open public uh, participation item two on the agenda. This is the um, public, uh, comment on anything that is not a public hearing tonight. Uh, we have one public hearing and that is uh, the concept review for Diagonal Plaza. So if you have anything you would like to uh, comment to us on other than uh, Diagonal Plaza, now would be the time to raise your hand. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, also split the public comment into two because we had technical problems starting. So after the AMPS, I'll go ahead and anybody who did not speak who had trouble getting on this meeting on time could, could raise their hand at that point and we'll just take another quick public comment. So with that, um, uh, Jean, I guess I'll ask you to look for hands and uh, unmute people who might want to speak now. I see one, um, Kurt Nordback. And so, um, okay, we can do that. And then 
And then we'll do, so just so, I'm, so we're clear, David, we'll do this um, bit of open comment and then um, the AMPS update and then reopen general open comment. Yes, and I'll ask anyone who spoke during this one not to raise their hand. I don't want people okay. to speak twice. And so if if someone wants to address any other topic that's not AMPS, they should wait for that second one. Um, oh, I, I, yeah, I think that we can just um, let anyone who showed up to do public comment speak now, uh, As but, but it would also give people the opportunity to weigh in on AMPS. And then if everyone gets a chance to speak, we may not have anybody after this one. So anyone can speak on any subject other than Diagonal Plaza right now. Does that make sense? Okay, that, that makes sense. Great. All right. Um, My screen is frozen. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Okay. I, okay. Um, I was able to allow Kurt to talk. So great. Maybe Kurt, you can try. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so Kurt Norbeck, and thank you very much for accommodating. I'm sorry, I should have spoken at the previous meeting. I didn't realize that it wasn't a public comment item. And so it was my error. Anyhow, I just wanted to talk briefly about AMPS, uh, speaking just for myself tonight. I, I think that what you have in the staff proposal is a good first step insofar as it goes. I think it's, it's taking the right choices uh, in the options that the staff outlined. So I think that that's great. I, um, I did send you an email before the last meeting, just doing a very rough back, back of the envelope calculation that indicated that even after the increase in the price of the MPP, it, it still seems like it is vastly undervaluing land in the city. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to point that out and say, we're still basically subsidizing parking immensely, even after five years or whatever it is of increase. Um, but I like the idea that the staff is proposing incremental change. I think in general, in a, a lot of planning issues, incremental change is a great way to go. And uh, certainly for parking, which, you know, can it's, it's difficult for people to adjust to change. And so changing incrementally is good. And I would love to see the same thing applied when we change the parking, the, the, the parking requirements in the land use code uh, to, to have some mechanism whereby they decrease by a certain percentage a year or something like that. The one other thing I'd like to say is it would be great if, since we're allowing people to rent space on the street to store a motor vehicle, it would be great if we said, oh, you know, if you want to use that space for some other use, you can also rent the space for that to put in a bike corral or to build a little mini park or to put in a rain garden or something like that. And not to, not, not to restrict ourselves to the use of storing motor vehicles um, when they're not in use. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Jean, I don't see any other hands, so let's go ahead and um, uh, if, if that's okay with you, Jean, we can move on then to our next agenda item, and then we can just loop back and see if anybody who had trouble joining would like to, to speak in a second round. Uh, sorry to, to make things complicated, Cindy, but uh, I, I know when it's a late start, we just don't want people to feel left out. So with that, um, we, uh, uh, with our apologies to uh, Chris and company, uh, we had to move uh, the, this item uh, from the last meeting. So thank you for your patience. And uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Chris Jones for the AMPS implementation and progress revitalizing access in Boulder update. Thanks, Dave. And I'm here with Chris Haglin. I don't have screen sharing rights currently. So hopefully Jean or someone can help me with that.
David, you should be able to do that. And if you want to transfer host back to me, that will be fine too. I lost it with getting blipped out. I'm just looking at how to do that now. When I click on the three dots, I see a lot of allows. It, you should be able to go to this, um, hover over my name and, and see a blue button called more. Yeah. I'm going to make you the host because I didn't see the way to do that. Oh, okay. Looks like Cindy's the, the host now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I feel so special. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Well, I can change the meeting options to make all panelists be able to sh share. Should I do that? That'd be great. All right. Let's try that. Chris, try it now. Um, negative. Uh, Chris Haglin, are you able to share your screen? We could just talk. <laughs> Amps are great. Y'all are doing awesome. <laughs> These things happen. A lot of ones tonight, it seems like. So I sorry, think, folks. I think it's official. Uh, Mercury must be retrograde. Um, that's that's just. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah, when I went back and looked at the setting that I made for all panelists, it had been undone to only host. So I don't know why. It's not letting me share either. Cindy, I can't see any of that without um, even co-host or host ability. So I'm- I just made you the host, Jean. Oh, sweet. So let's see what I can do here. Okay, Chris, you are now a co-host. See if you can- Yes. Share. Mercury is not retrograde, apparently. <laughs> At least in the last minute. <laughs> All right, are folks seeing? My screen. Yeah, thumbs up. All right, Chris Haglin. You're yeah, on. thank you. So uh, good evening, planning board. Uh, my name is Chris Haglin. I'm the acting manager of the transportation planning division of transportation and mobility. And as you know, I am joined by Chris Jones, Dep deputy director of community vitality. And we are here tonight to speak to you on revitalizing access in Boulder and specifically on neighborhood parking management. Uh, and parking pricing, which also includes parking fine strategies. This is the agenda we have for you this evening. Uh, following a brief refresher of the project background, I will share with you the process we have undertaken to get to this stage where we have been developing and refining strategic options. And then Chris will take over and sh share with you our progress on neighborhood parking management and parking pricing strategies. And then it will come back to me and I'll talk about parking fines before moving on to explaining what our next steps are and then the questions we have for you tonight. Uh, as you know, AMPS and the projects under its umbrella is ultimately guided by a set of planning documents that provide a policy framework and a set of objectives to fulfill the vision for our community. These documents include the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, which outlines planning and land use policies, the sustainability framework, which covers environmental and resiliency policies, the transportation master plan, and last but not least, the economic sustainability strategy, which promotes economic vitality and a strong relationship between the city and our business community. Uh, all of those documents have informed and shaped the access management and parking strategy. Uh, and these are the guiding principles that were adopted by council in 2017. Uh, we know that in Boulder, our residents, our employees and our visitors use a wide variety of of modes to uh, get around and we have to provide access for all. We need to employ new innovative tools and strategies to improve multimodal access and manage demand. We need to be inclusive and recognize the diversity within our community and strive to advance social and racial equity. We need policies and programs that not only have transportation access benefits, but also economic vitality and environmental benefits. 
And of course, in our fast changing and unpredictable world, as we've seen in the last year, uh, we need to plan for the present, but also adapt to future social, uh, environmental, technological and economic changes. Um, this chart here, which you've seen before, I believe, uh, shows the variety of projects that, underway, that are underway under the AMPS umbrella. This includes our Chautauqua uh, program where we manage parking there at the park and also provide a free shuttle service um, for our government offices uh, down in the civic area and the main library. We implement, implemented a new parking management strategy and also a parking cash out program for city employees. Um, also under the AMPS umbrella are the parking code changes and the, and the TDM uh, ordinance for new developments uh, due to staff reductions in planning and development services. Uh, this project has been put on hold, but we hope to revise it very, revive it very soon. Uh, the final two projects are what we're here to discuss with you tonight, and that is the neighborhood uh, parking management and parking pricing, as I said, includes the fines. This graphic here illustrates, illustrates the project timeline. Uh, currently, we're designing the implementation and action plan, which outlines these preferred strategies as well as our next steps and costs. Uh, we're bringing these to all our boards and commissions now in preparation for a study session with council in June. Uh, overall, the project objectives are to rework uh, our neighborhood parking management policies and parking pricing to be more aligned with our broader city goals around access and mobility. Um, to meet these objectives, we've been analyzing our existing conditions. We've conducted extensive community engagement, and we've also looked at best practices in other communities. Uh, in terms of com community engagement, we've shared information on our project website, We've collected responses through polls and surveys. We've met with many different community groups and we had a community working group as well called Access Allies, which was made up of representatives of boards, commissions, property owners, and other stakeholders such as the Downtown Boulder Partnership. Um, we have also worked with our community connectors. These are our paid liaisons who help us reach those hard, harder to get to community uh, demographics and, and communities. So uh, that's been a great effort uh, to, uh, to use those community connectors and, and get to those populations. Uh, we've also held focus groups with residents in our current, some current NPP neighborhoods. Uh, as you can see from these demographics, we've done a, a good job in gathering community feedback through a variety of, of mechanisms, the polls and the surveys, and our outreach and use of our community connect, connectors and, and other uh, innovative techniques during these COVID times, uh, we've been quite successful in reaching some of those harder uh, to reach demographics, uh, including people of color, uh, citizens that are under 25, those that are over 25, and then also those who rent as opposed to own homes. Um, throughout this process, we've engaged our boards and commissions uh, and the public to develop the strategic options that we'll be sharing with you uh, tonight in each of these focus areas. Uh, we've received specific feedback from boards and commissions along the way to specifically engage our MPP holders, uh, mobile businesses that make use of those neighborhoods where we manage uh, demand, and also specifically to address social equity issues. We also formed an Access Allies Light Group. This was a subset of the larger Access Allies Group, and this was made up of only representatives of our boards and commissions so that we can really dive deeper into policies. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Jones. Thank you, Chris Aglin. Um, so good evening, planning board. Um, I'm just uh, going to run through a few slides um, on our strategies um, before we get to our, our next steps and questions. Um, what you see in front of you here are our goals that we developed for neighborhood parking management. I'm not going to read through each of these, but these were developed based on all of the feedback we've received from the community, from boards and commissions, from our access allies. These are the goals that we look to as we consider different strategies to resolve some of our challenges in neighborhood parking management. 
So strategies that we have considered um, are first uh, minor program adjustments. So just looking at our existing program and understanding the challenges that, that people who are either in an NPP or considering an NPP or are adjacent to an NPP, um, we could have pursued a strategy to, to kind of focus on a status quo approach, um, but modify that program to mitigate some of the persistent program challenges. Another strategy we looked at was data-based uh, decision-making, which would have been uh, staff-driven identification and implementation of neighborhood parking management strategies. So more of a, a proactive um, staff-led approach to changing the way that we manage parking in neighborhoods. The third strategy that we've considered is called the priority-based neighborhood access management, where it's kind of a hybrid of the database decision-making with um, some carry forward of our petitioning process, where we want to look at available management tools for neighborhood parking and identify and prioritize those tools based on key performance indicators that we would measure in neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, not just parking uh, utilization and uh, capacity, but also things like transit access, intensity of land uses, um, key trip generators, um, looking at a number of these, these key performance indicators and then prioritize tools um, that would be appropriate um, to address challenges that result from, from all of those things combined. Um, that said, once we've identified and prioritized those tools, implementation of them would still require a neighborhood petition to move forward. When we measured those three strategies against our goals that were developed earlier in the process and vetted by council, um, the third strategy, priority-based neighborhood access management, was identified as the most aligned goal or most aligned strategy to meet the, the goals that we have developed. Um, if we were to move forward with this strategy, um, some key first steps that we're looking at, given that one of the goals is to achieve cost recovery for the neighborhood parking management program, um, we are proposing that we adjust in 2022 both resident and commuter annual permit rates by $13 for uh, residents and $20 a year, um, respectively, for commuters. Um, in next year and then for the subsequent years until 2024 will increase by 10 and 20 um, dollars a year for both the resident and commuter permits to get to cost recovery. Once we've gotten to that point, then we can have an, a conversation about um, as we uh, generate a surplus in the program, um, other ways that we want to utilize these resources to provide more access tools in the neighborhoods that are part of the program. In order to do this, we do need to update our, our ordinance that, that governs the neighborhood parking permit program and other regulations that allow for this process. Um, in order to do that, we want to maintain our pause on any new NPP zones um, into 2022, which will allow us time to collect more parking supply, occupancy, trip generation data, and, and um, all the prioritization of our key performance indicators so that we can provide an access score in residential zones throughout the city. Once we've done that, then we can establish our eligibility and priority for the possible creation of new neighborhood management zones and tools, um, and maybe even possibly phasing out um, neighborhoods who are currently um, in the NPP that would no longer meet the, those key criteria. With all this, we want to make sure that we develop um, clear communications and outreach materials um, for folks to understand these changes as they're coming. For parking pricing and fines, again, we had another set of very similar goals that we vetted with the community, access allies, and we ran by council um, in January of this year um, to check in and make sure we're headed uh, in the right direction on this front. And in looking at different parking pricing strategies, we um, identified three strategies. One would be static price adjustments. So kind of the same way we approach, we've approached uh, uh, on-street uh, pricing changes and garage changes, just periodic price increases based on budget needs, uh, CPI and peer assessments of what other communities are charging for parking. Another strategy we've looked at is place-based pricing. So identifying specific zones throughout the city um, where we currently manage parking or could manage parking and identify pricing based on a geographic um, a cumulative, cumulative uh, utilization of parking in those areas. A third strategy we looked at was performance-based pricing. So not geographic-based, but street corridor-based, looking at the finer grain data um, along specific corridors and uh, just prices um, based on that data um, uh, as appropriate. 
when we measure those three strategies against the goals that we had developed, um, the performance-based uh, pricing was identified as our most aligned strategy um, if we wanted to, to accomplish uh, these goals more effectively. Um, and so if we were to pursue that strategy, um, some things that we would be looking at is pricing our on-street parking higher than our off-street um, parking, so the mostly caged garages. Um, corridors could be set to a premium standard and economy rate, depending on their typical peak occupancy. Some of our premium corridors, if they still continue to have um, high occupancy or usage, um, could be assigned paid priority spaces that are even more or time restricted or more expensive um, or identified specifically for folks who've registered their, their freight license plates or Uber or Lyft uh, license plates for these pick up and drop off, sp drop off spaces. Corridor rates um, would be updated regularly, possibly annually, um, based on typical peak demand. And our new meters that we've just finished installing um, downtown, um, fortunately, are able to easily be programmed with these new rate schedules, where our old meters were just much, it was much more cumbersome to implement um, uh, dynamic pricing. On the right here, you see an example of how we could choose to brand these different um, parking areas, these corridors, and we're suggesting maybe using CU's colors with gold being the higher priced uh, corridor and our base rate being um, branded with the, the black color. Um, and that's just that it's just a proposal at this time, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way that we could um, inform the community about these different pricing. Um, so if we were to pursue this strategy, um, again, we need to take a look at our parking ordinances and regulations to allow for these regular price increases um, and dynamic pricing. Um, we want to start in January 2022 with an increase in our on-street rate throughout the city of 25 cents. Um, so from $1.25 per hour to $1.50 per hour. And with our new pay stations, we can also easily create a 15 minute free option. So folks who are just popping into a place of business real quick um, can easily um, use our new pay stations and register once a day, 15 minute free um, on street. This is a change that we um, have just added to the presentation based on feedback that we've received from other boards and commissions. Another thing that we would move forward with is maintaining our current rate in garages at $1.25 per hour, um, but eliminate our four hour graduated fee, where right now if you stay in a garage for longer than four hours, it increases to $2.50 per hour. So we would eliminate that. So folks who might feel um, uh, an economic crunch of this increase in our on-street rate will still have the option to park for $1.25 per hour in the garages. That said, we are proposing that we extend our $3 um, evening rate, our flat rate that we have in garages since um, late 2019, um, we would extend that into the weekends, all day on weekends. So we no longer um, would be offering free parking on weekends, but rather a $3 flat rate. Again, with all these changes, we would seek to develop uh, communications and outreach materials to inform the public um, of these changes and, and, and encourage them to park appropriately based on their needs. Um, Again, once we are able to collect data, um, um, after we've made these changes, we would implement the dynamic rates um, based on that data, um, installing the signage, and, and moving forward with that strategy. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chris to talk about parking fines. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so over the course of this effort, uh, we honed in on three different parking fine strategies uh, for consideration. The first was essentially a status quo. Uh, the second was the using graduated fines. And then also what we're calling, oh, we didn't switch the slides on this one. Oh, but so. we, we were trying to find a new term for transportation choice fines. Uh, I think we did get some comments on planning board uh, from planning board the first time we came here. But we were thinking about maybe mobility safety fines is one of those. Uh, but this was so it would include the graduated fines and then the fines for um, people who are impeding other travel choices. So this would be something like parking in a bike lane or parking in front of a bus stop and impeding transit access. Um, and then the third level was looking at uh, a combination of the graduated fines and the mobility safety fines, but then also looking at different fines for uh, different uh, parts of the cities where we have managed parking, such as Cajun versus Uni Hill versus Boulder Junction. 
um, when we started looking at oh, my computer's frozen. Oh. <laughs> I swear. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so once we started looking at these compared to the goals that were set in feasibility, uh, we determined that, uh, that having the graduated fines and the mobility safety fines were uh, the most aligned with our goals. And so if we were to go down this path, uh, what we would have, what we would want to do first is uh, do a just a base increase uh, in the fines from 15 to $30. Uh, and then we would have the graduated fines that would increase, you know, we're suggesting perhaps 25% each time, but capped at the third violation. Uh, and then the mobility safety violations, they would be uh, set uh, at a higher level to begin with as starting at $60, and then also would have a graduated uh, feature to them. Oh, it's so slow now. Okay. Um, and so if we were to move forward with this strategy, of course, we would need to update the ordinance and publish the new fine schedule. And then we would create those uh, communications and outreach materials to let the public know of these changes. And then overall for, the, for this, uh, all of this work in terms of the next steps, uh, we'll be developing our implementation and action plan uh, based on the preferred strategies that move forward. And, and after we get additional feedback uh, from city council at the June study session, and then we'll plan on returning to planning board in probably the third or fourth quarter as we continue to refine and finalize these different strategies. And with that, that concludes our presentation. And these are the questions that we have for you. Uh, I know that we have those in your packet uh, in case people want to look at each other instead of um, small photos and, and looking at just the, the slides. So these are the questions we have for you tonight. Thank you so much, Chris and Chris, uh, for that presentation. And yes, I'll go ahead and just uh, read the questions uh, as we uh, uh, see comment from uh, the planning board. And um, you probably noticed uh, by the screenshot that uh, Chris Jones showed that I was uh, asked to be an access ally. So I've been to two meetings, uh, one on MPP and one on the parking strategy. So, or the, I'm sorry, the parking pricing. So I, I will try not to be too redundant, but I'll kind of summarize some of the comments I had there for, for this group. Uh, so um, with that, uh, what is, um, the first question is, what is the board's feedback on the refined strategies, the process used to develop them and whether the refined strategies are appropriate for Boulder and the community's design? Uh, desired direction. Uh, hand, uh, so with a raise of hands, feel free to weigh in, Lisa. Um, yeah, so I had a couple of questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, I was curious, um, so I'm definitely pro-graduated fines. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, weigh in here in this forum a little bit about kind of how you picked those base rates to start with, um, you know, and then how it graduates over time. And, you know, if you looked to peer cities or looked to, you know, consumer behavior and just kind of how you, how you set them. Um, we look to the university. So the university charges $30 for um, their first fine. So that's, we wanted to be as consistent as possible with CU. Okay. Uh, and there are communities that charge more and there are communities that charge less, but we figure it would probably be appropriate for us to, to um, maintain that consistency. Well, and do the graduated fines also match CU's? I don't know that CU graduates that way. Do you know, Chris? I, I don't think <clears throat> they do. Um, but we can check on that and get back to you. Oh, yeah, I was just curious. You know, I, I, I like the theory of the graduate designs. I'm, but just also for communications and outreach, you know, I think it's useful to be like, oh, well, this is the same thing that Broomfield does or Denver does, or, you know, this is how we set it. Um, so I'd be curious to learn more. Okay. Great. Any other comments on the strategy? Sarah. Um, it's more of a question than a comment. Uh, I'm just not sure I'm getting the equity component here. Um, the, uh, the, the, the large jump uh, in uh, NPP parking permits uh, might be affordable for some, but for others, it might actually be uh, uh, the thing that pushes them over the edge. Uh, Cause I think you're going from 17 in now to 
in three years, you'd be at 50, which is for a lot of people, a lot of money. So what's the equity framework here? It's certainly something that we're considering. I think it's important to note that it's been $17 since 1994. And so if you look at um, inflation, um, and we haven't provided a, an equity uh, low income uh, benefit for this product in the past, if you look at inflation, um, we're actually, we're, we'll be getting to the point where it's, it's actually equivalent to what it was in 1994. Does not mean that we don't want to consider um, that, uh, that challenge. And so we are looking into ways to, to make sure that we are providing a, a discount benefit for the most appropriate folks. Um, so that is a detail that will come out through the process. Okay, because I'm just a little concerned. We see more and more projects coming our way where, where the applicant is asking for parking reductions, uh, which is pushing cars out in, onto the streets, which is neither a good nor a bad, but now you're creating a cost associated with that. Um, and I think we just have to bear in mind that we might, first of all, it's gonna make housing houses with uh, garages, the cost will go up even further. Uh, and for those folks who have to live in a place where there's, a park, where there's not enough parking for the number of cars that are there, they're gonna be this added cost. And I just think we need to keep that in mind. Well, and again, another piece of this is what we'd really like to do instead of just having this program be about managing um, residents parking on street, it's about also making sure that, that folks have other tools available to them like eco passes or um, car share membership or um, bike share membership so that, that we can provide other types of tools for folks that do have um, um, economic challenges. Go for it, Lucita. <laughs> I think she, she has an idea of the kind of question I have because it's the follow-up for to her. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I think, um, so uh, my question has to do with the people who don't have cars just to go and, you know, go skiing or have literally like the majority of the people in this town, but people who actually need a car to work because it's a very different, you know, kind of population. And, um, one of the things that I, I was wondering, because it really directly impacts, I'm thinking, I mean, the equity piece that uh, Sarah brought up is, I know that we're supposed to have equity lenses and tools. I, I like to kind of hear a little bit more specifically, how would you consider the issue of parking if it's related to someone who works out of that car, say for example, is a vehicle that is used for business as opposed to for leisure. Is there something that the city has that you know looks at that kind of detail information? And or you know, do they look at the income of the person? We do not currently have a product specifically for um, businesses that operate out of a vehicle like. Uh, roofers or home cleaners or or those types of, of um, uses. However, as we're moving to license plate recognition um, away from physical permits um, for individual residences, we do have more flexibility in the types of products and the ways that people can register their vehicles um, for those types of uses. So it's certainly something that technology is getting to a point where, where eventually we can. We're not proposing that level of detail right now today, um, but when we're talking about neighborhood parking management tools um, and, and we're seeking to implement appropriately based on the, the key performance indicators that are different in, in neighborhoods throughout the city, um, that's certainly the type of thing that we, and the nuance that we want to take into consideration. We did actually have a lot of conversations with um, a number of NPP, um, residents as well as businesses who are operating and having those types of challenges. And so we have been making sure that this process um, has been listening to their challenges. Again, we're not going to be able to solve parking. Um, uh, it's a, it's, it, parking will always be one of those things. As long as people are driving as much as they do in our society, we're going to have challenges in this area. But um, really want you to to feel confident that we have been having conversations with, with folks who do have those experiences and reflecting that in the work going forward. 
And I just, we are, we're in our strategy development phase right now. So this is exactly the type of feedback that we want and need to make sure that as we get into um, the implementation, uh, we, are, we are able to address those types of challenges. You know, if I may add one last thing, because, you know, I, right now we're in the middle of talking about, you know, decarbonization of our industry and transportation and everything else. Um, it's so exciting. Um, but also realize that we are making plans, grandiose plans, where there will be a whole swath so people will not be able to afford technologies um, that, you know, will get us there. So that's part of what I'm, I, I like to remind all of us that even though we can have all these plans, ultimately not everybody is able to buy into it because of the great inequities in this country. So um, how do we facilitate some of these changes knowing that the people who are usually thinking about this are the ones who are probably gonna be able to move on to the next century or the next phase while the people who can't make it may not be able to tell you so please make sure that you do get those voices and that feedback because we will be missing out on the biggest challenges if we don't know what is really getting in the way of them to be able to you know move forward with us yes Thank and you. that's yeah heard loud and clear we got the same feedback from council in january that's why we had those conversations with those folks and the community connectors have been involved in this process from day go to make sure that, that those voices are part of our decision making Thank you. And Lupita and Sarah, I, I know that um, I brought both all those issues up actually in the uh, Access Alley's meetings too. So uh, yeah, I would definitely reinforce and encourage us to keep that on, on our radar uh, and uh, start and work on that. Uh, any other uh, comments on question number one on the strategies? Uh, questions or comments? Lisa? Um. Yeah, uh, I was just looking at the impeding other traffic choices. Um, and I, I guess something I wanted to offer on that around equity and so on is that I, I don't know if any of you follow, um, and now I'm blanking on his name, but it's another Chris and he's a city council member in Denver um, who is in a wheelchair and frequently will post to social media and otherwise um, showing the ways in which he is impeded in moving uh, through spaces, particularly sidewalks and just how things get um, parked. So I, I guess it's um, less a question as a compliment, um, just, you know, that I think it's good to include that and to make sure that it also addresses disability, um, as well as things like blocking bike lanes, you know, or impeding buses, um, you know, but to think about all the different ways that our community members need to move. And, you know, you, you might have to backtrack an entire block or further to hit a curb cut, and now you're out in the street in your chair, and it's just not a good situation. So um, I was pleased to see that. And we can certainly call out ADA as well, just to make that very clear. Right. I just had a, a quick question more than, more than a comment. I was curious what, why you use the increases for the NPP for residents and commuters? What, what were, how, did those, how were those numbers arrived at, those incremental increases? So, um, we did some modeling with the goal of um, getting to cost recovery. Um, right now, our, our uh, commuter permits are already significantly more expensive than our residential permits. Um, and it's the commuter permits that, that help us recover um, costs in our neighborhoods that are close to um, places like downtown. Um, and so we, we will continue to have them be our more expensive product moving into the future. Um, we got some feedback, though, at a previous um, commission meeting that we were previously proposing $100 a year increase to commuter permits um, as opposed to the 20. And so the disparity between the two is going to get even more significant. The feedback was received that, that we should maybe think about not having that be so broad. Um, and so we did um, reduce the proposal for commuter permits to $20 a year um, to be more manageable, especially for folks um, with economic challenges. So um, it's partially just a, uh, based on the conclusion of, of where we're at with pricing right now, um, knowing that we wanna get to cost recovery and looking at what rates we need to increase those permits to, to get to that point. Um, beyond that, I don't know that it was, we're not benchmarking currently to um, any other communities, 
but we also want to pay attention to what it costs to park in our garages, which right now I think is uh, just over $1,200 a year um, for a permit in a downtown garage. And so we, we were originally proposing to get as, as much as $900 a year for a commuter permit in a neighborhood, um, which was, was getting to a point where, where uh, there were gonna be some equity issues for parking in a neighborhood versus parking in a downtown garage. Thanks. Okay, well, um, we could, um, and uh, again, these questions uh, provide some possibility for overlap here, but the second question is, what is the board's feedback on whether the strategies most aligned with the goals from the alternatives analysis process should be implemented? Does anybody have any comments or questions on the uh, prioritization of the strategies and how they were selected? Okay, not seeing any hands. Um, what is the board's feedback on the proposed key next steps in implementation for each of the strategies? Any, uh, anything anybody would like to share? So what, I, um, what I'll do then is um, I'll just, um, I, I'll go through my notes on things that I've shared uh, and uh, let people uh, add to that if you have any <laughs> anything you think I didn't say correctly or, or whatever. But um, one, one of the things that I pointed out uh, is the gradual increases are, are good. And I think that it, um, I, I do agree with comments that um, we are underpricing from a real estate perspective, but, uh, but we know that uh, it's difficult for the public to adjust to very dramatic increases. And so I think that, the, that uh, this is a very good approach and it'll give us flexibility in uh, really helping bring the public along as we try to move us away from single car dependency. Uh, the equity uh, things brought up, I won't go into again because I think that uh, uh, Lupita and Sarah really expressed those well. Um, I know that as uh, when we look at development projects uh, in planning board, we routinely have transportation issues as the number one concern of people near the project, uh, traffic and parking. And so we, um, because MPP has gotten to the point where we actually have a moratorium, it's very difficult for us to look at projects where we, it would be really nice to be able to say, oh, we can mitigate this with an MPP. So getting this tool more nimble and getting us able to know at concept review time that we'd like to see an MPP worked out by site review would be something quite interesting, I think, because it would really help people know that uh, things can be managed. Did you want to comment on that, Sarah? Well, I want to comment on the process, the NPP process. <laughs> oh, somebody's dog. Um, the, uh, the, I hadn't realized that the neighborhood itself had to participate or, or call for um, an and participate, uh, belonging to or creating an NPP. And I'm wondering if that, I'm sure there's a good reason why we have that process, but I'm wondering if in fact, it is a barrier rather than a, 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 a green flag. Um, and what, what might it look like if we got rid of or, or modified the neighborhood in the neighborhood um agree i don't know what even to call it the neighborhood petitioning decision yeah that is good feedback we did consider an approach that did not um, include neighborhood petitioning and we got specific feedback from council um in january that they wanted to maintain some sort of um, neighborhood involvement in, in the actual um, outlay of uh, neighborhood parking management strategies. And so um, that's why we've, we've kept it um, in, in the sense that, that that's how we currently do it. If there's another way that we could um, get neighborhoods to, to still be involved in the process, it's something we could maybe consider. We'll certainly take that feedback and let council know that that's something that we heard from you all um, in, in that our petitioning process could provide, could be a barrier for some um, neighborhoods that, 
that need better parking management, but they don't necessarily have the, the means to organize in a way that, that makes it happen. Well, it also points, I don't mean to step over anyone, but it also points to the challenges of trying to get a neighborhood eco pass. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it becomes a, uh, it's, it's, it's just a bear, it's a barrier to progress. Um, and I'm, again, I'm sure there are reasons why we've been doing it this way, but um, it, it's, it's, they're both barriers to just making the change. Um, and, um, and I'm not speaking for the whole board. I'm speaking just for myself. It just seems to me like if we could massage that a little bit and make it easier, that might be better. So I can speak to that a little bit and I don't think it pushes me into one corner or the other necessarily. Um, but there, even, even when you like, and I can't remember what the threshold is 70%, 80%, maybe somebody has it pulled up. Um, but even when you hit that threshold, what I remember seeing is that there were always neighbors who were actually opposed to having an MPP. Um, and so I don't know, this is perhaps bad terminology, but like, you know, it kind of provided the city with cover and with something to refer to, to, you know, say, hey, X percent, which is well in excess of the majority of the people in your neighborhood are saying they want this. And that's why we're putting it in place. Um, as opposed to like, oh, 20% of you wanted it and we decided it was a good idea and now you have to pay for parking in front of your house, um, which some people get upset about. Um, you know, so I don't think that necessarily means we can or can't or should or shouldn't change it. Um, but I think that was one of the reasons why it was originally structured that way um, was so that you, know, you could say, hey, most of your neighbors wanted it. And so now it's a thing you have to live with. That's helpful. Thank you, Lisa. Great. And I'll just uh, go ahead and um, unless somebody else wants to raise their hand, uh, there's some other comments that I had were the technology uh, that, that is used uh, can open up lots of doors for some pretty uh, interesting things that could make it parking a lot easier for people. QR codes, license plate recognition, um, being able through apps to access your account online and just uh, so, so there's and and also open up more flexible ideas. A lot of the things like you're talking about now, for for uh, for how to uh, to accommodate different needs. So I, I think that the technology aspect is really interesting. So those are kind of the areas I, I had talked about. Anybody want to say anything else before we? Great. Well, um, I think this oh, is. No, sorry, David. Oh, go ahead. Listen. Um, I was just going to say also, yes, to, uh, I agree with the technology and then especially that ability to, um, you know, do basically surge pricing or whatever we're calling it. Um, I think it's absolutely huge because when we talk about parking management, it's not just about, you know, being a public good that's being used, you know, to benefit other businesses and so on. But, um, but also that we're trying to make sure that if you need a spot to park, that you can find a spot to park. Um, and I know I brought it up last time under AMPS, I'm sure you hear it from lots of other people, but um, at least prior to the pandemic, there are certainly times when I've tried to go park downtown and circled and circled and circled and every lot is full. And you know, one of the tools we have to manage that kind of behavior is you know, having surge pricing. Um, quick question I should have asked earlier and probably somewhere in the packet and I missed it. Are we extending the time past 7 p.m. or whenever it was, or are we leaving that for now? We're not currently proposing an extension of um, the parking, paid parking hours. Some key considerations for that are just the changing of, of, of signage and all the, all the things that we have, everything downtown, all of our signs say 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we would have to switch all those out, which is part of doing business. But um, it's administratively there's a burden, and then we would have to also staff um, enforcement staff more hours. If we're going to charge for parking, we need to make sure that we have staff to to enforce that those those hours. And so there are implications there that just kind of snowball. And so we're not proposing that at this time. We do have parking challenges beyond 7 p.m., um, and so we are aware of that, um, but not proposing that right now. Okay, cool. I mean, this is such a suite of changes already. Um, so yeah, I want to say push for that now, but I would say just continue to do what I'm sure you're already doing, which is collecting data on how parked up stuff is past 7 p.m. and then maybe build it into later changes if warranted. 
Yeah, and at a similar, on a similar vein, I had also brainstormed that, uh, you know, we do the two to three hour um, <clears throat> uh, free parking and after that you get a ticket in MPP zones. Uh, gosh, another option would be to just go ahead and charge for non-permit holders uh, and, uh, and maybe change the model in some MPP districts, especially the ones close into the downtown. Uh, but of course, that's, that's something for the future as well. So, great. So tool in our toolbox. <laughs> Okay, well, the great discussion, everybody. Uh, thanks so much to, and uh, you know, I think all the next steps look fantastic. You, you guys are doing a great job with this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you the much. input. And we certainly look forward to coming back to you as we further refine these strategies. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, great. And um, yes, uh, for those people who might have had trouble joining or didn't know that we were starting at five thirty. We did do a brief uh, open comment period earlier where um, one person spoke who, um, but uh, I, I thought we should go ahead and reopen our public participation for anything that is not a public hearing one more time, just uh, to be so that you don't feel like you were uh, left out. So if you would like to speak to us about anything other than the Diagonal Pro uh, Plaza project, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and Jean will call on you. Uh, other, anyone other than Kurt, of course, haha. -ha. Is there anyone out there who would like to speak? Okay, I see, I see one hand. Um, and I know that's a little more difficult in the webinar function to change how your name displays. So if uh, folks could, we do um, ask for a full name and then if you could please add your address for the record. Um, and I see Ginger with your hand up. So Ginger, you can go ahead and start. You have three minutes. Okay. Is that unmuted? Because I don't see my picture, but that's okay. I don't need yeah, to see myself. The video won't show, but um, okay. But we can hear you. Cool. Okay, so I am talking about the diagonal plaza. So is that all right or no? Um, actually, um, you'll be talking later uh, uh, when we're in that item. So, okay. um, and, uh, and we'll ask at that time that you just state your full name and, and uh, either neighborhood or address. Yes. That'd be great. Okay. Um, any pleasure? Thanks, anyway. <laughs> uh -huh, thank you. Uh, anyone else out there? Lynn had mentioned, oh, had asked about open comment in the chat. Um, Lynn, did you wanna address the board in open comment? Okay. Yeah, um, I'm just, as I've been writing you, well, I actually need to, I guess I'll call David because I don't have Lisa's number, but you were talking something about people in the neighborhood having to, having to vote on charging for permits. Anyway, just saying, um, there needs to be more dialogue in these meetings and things would be a lot faster because you still have to read all my emails. You still have to not respond to them if that's what you choose to do, but it's still out there. Um, and I'm going to say the same thing all over again. I just went to a homeless meeting of the county, and there's the same old discussion about the same old things. All their programs, all their clients, their homeless clients, and all of the, the um, homelessness that's being created by this system, this revolving door that the city council and the planning board consistently apply with 1727 per the electric car elevator so that they can save on the space that the ramp takes up and they get a third story because it's not allowed unless they go to planning board and beg. So there's all this begging. And then there's another kind of begging, the kind of begging that comes from the American Recovery Act, from the stimulus payments to the city and the county the federal money that's paying for all these programs that are in the cycle of despair that that does not improve housing. It improves <laughs> a worse situation. You know, you might train people, for example, to get out of homelessness in Boulder, but then what? They're trained. Are they are you gonna send them to engineering school? I don't think so. You're gonna send them to Bridge House. And they're gonna get trained in landscaping like Lupus um, Lupita's always talking about where they're gonna park with their landscaping truck, you know, to service everything in Boulder. 
or they're going to get trained in the culinary arts so they can feed all the rich people in Boulder. I, I cook better than any of those restaurants anyway, so I don't eat out. But in any case, um, there's this cycle, and I don't know where those people go. Are we paying for these programs? I know you're not involved with those programs, right, at Bridge House, you know. But these things are all effects that come out of your policy decisions your decision on the third story at Olive, your decision on the third story at whatever, your decision on Marpa House, which was obscene, not oh, so not okay. Each one of those, and Sarah knows this now too, by now too, each one of those bedrooms is separate. What family is gonna rent an individual bedroom for each kid at 14 or $1,500 a bedroom? You know, what do you need? a sandbox outside of Marpa House for as a condition for them to be, um, to violate the non-conforming policy that you allowed them to violate, deliberately allowed them and sent that message to the city council and city council approved it. That is just unconscionable. That is a violation of every city council member's oath of office and it's a violation if you had to have an oath of office. It's a violation of your oath of office. It really is. That was non-conforming. It, it was increased non-conforming. And you, you voted on it. And, you know, 11 Marine, my God, two or three hours. You know, that should have been stopped right at the start. Um, the, you know, the begging... First, the begging goes through Housing and Human Services, Boulder Housing Partners, to the federal government, to the county government, to grants, to all of these things that supply Boulder with affordable housing. While Boulder is creating so much massively unaffordable housing, 311 was obscene what happened at 311. Obscene. The cost of that in wildfires, and the potential of a big event happening on our open space right in front of seniors on oxygen and all of this, you know, this is just, this is so basic. It's such basic fallacies of judgment. And it's one place after another. And each time another place is approved, my God, you know, right by no Joe Nagusa's office, there's a battalion of two, two lines of high-end condos, no doubt, with not even a friggin', I must have missed that planning board meeting, not even a friggin' uh, courtyard in between. And who's paying for the open space for all these people? You know, this is an all integrated process. That's why I depend, you're my favorite board, planning board, you know, because you have the most power in the city to make real change. But what we really need is a board that's integrated with all the boards. I try to do it all. You know, but I miss out because two of the boards that I I listen to are at the same night. But there's only so much I can do. But I can tell you this: I've seen it from the 37, 30 foot, thirty thousand feet perspective. And for thirty four years, I've been watching this, and and it's hard to watch in slow motion a crash, frame by frame. It's the same thing. Can you please change it? You know, you're going to have all these parking issues. You're going to have them as long as you keep subsidizing these developers. And you can't do it anymore. It's not, it's not going to benefit Boulder. It's going to burn the golden goose in the oven, you know? So thank you, thank you Lynn. Um, I think that um, uh, thank you for those comments. I hope that that was a stopping point because the, the clock was kind of uh, malfunctioning and running really slow, but we went more than three minutes and I we really- did. I was thinking that was seeming slow, but um, I'm thinking my computer's just doing odd things tonight, so we won't use well, that. I'm changing. We appreciate the comments, Lynn. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you got a few extra mi uh, minute, uh, s seconds there for sure. We appreciate it. Uh, so um, with that, let's, um, I don't, do we have any more hands? I don't think we do for the general public comment. So let's move into um, our public hearing for tonight. Uh, we are here to see a concept plan review and comment for the redevelopment of a 9.27 acre property located at 
uh, 28th and Iris uh, area. Uh, and uh, as a mixed use development that includes ground floor retail along 28th Street and the proposed street A along with ground floor amenity space with upper story workforce, uh, well, workforce or regular housing and uh, permanently affordable apartments. Uh, and the two options are proposed, which I won't read through right now because I know the staff will be telling us about those. Um, this is gonna be a concept review. So I just wanna make sure the public knows that we're not gonna be taking official action here. Uh, we're gonna be making recommendations and weighing in on uh, the things that were asked. So uh, we won't, uh, for example, be making specific votes on any particular land use change or anything like that in this meeting. Uh, just to put that into context for your comments. Um, and with that, uh, we're going, I'd like to ask board members if they have any ex parte or uh, potential conflict of interest that they would need to disclose for this item. Sir? Uh, just that I went to the site today uh, to get a feel for it. Okay. Peter? Several years ago, I hosted a fundraiser at the site, but not uh, on this parcel involving these owners or anyone associated with the project. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Georgie? I, I, uh, I toured the site today as well on my own, but I haven't spoken with anyone about it. Okay. And I've also toured the site uh, and uh, had one member of the public ask me at what time they, I thought this would come up tonight, but we didn't discuss anything about the project. Anything else? All right, well, I'll turn it over to Charles and Elaine to do the presentation. Great, thanks very much. Elaine McLaughlin, our case manager, senior planner, will present staff's analysis this evening. So Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Very good. Thanks, Charles. Good evening, planning board members. Um, hoping you can see my screen. Let me know if you don't. And I'm gonna um, fire up the PowerPoint here. Uh, so as uh, the chair, described it's a concept plan review. So it's intended to just provide the applicant comments, both from city staff and uh, members of the public, as well as planning board and possibly city council if they wanna call it up. We look at a general development plan that um, uh, goes over everything from architectural characteristics to land uses and transportation patterns. And for this evening specifically, um, we're gonna look at the built and planning context. There's also a transportation context we wanna look at. And then um, in terms of key issues, a uh, couple of different key issues. One is um, if there's a discussion that could be had about potential rezoning and or land use change, um, given what's proposed this evening. And then also just to provide general feedback on the conceptual site plan and architecture. And so uh, with that, um, as most of us know, it's good to start with a broad planning perspective. And in this case, the BBCP has identified this site as a center. Um, and in particular, centers are generally places with uh, potential for infill and redevelopment and are higher intensity compared to established residential neighborhoods. In this particular case, it's considered a neighborhood center and um, it's defined in the BBCP as contributing to a sense of place and achievement of a walkable 15 minute place with a mix of uses and a range of services. And then in terms of uh, transportation context, the site's connected to multi-use paths and on-street bike routes that connect throughout the city. Um, it's near uh, 28th and um, the diagonal as well as 30th. And so when you look a little closer, there's also planned connections near this site uh, for multi-use paths. And then the site's well served by buses along 28th Street. That's considered a transit corridor. Um, it serves <clears throat> the 208, the 205, the Bolt, and then on 30th, the Bound, as you can see, circumnavigates around a couple block area of the site um, and surroundings. Um, the site's also, has some planned connections that are through the North 28th Street Transportation Network plan. And that also includes a couple of alternative configurations for roadway and bike connections through the site. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, <clears throat> excuse me, further in the key issues. 
And then also for planning uh, context, uh, the sites designated in the comp plan is community business. And um, it's defined as land uses um, that are predominantly commercial business uses um, with convenience shopping and some office. And it also important to this particular proposal and where feasible multiple uses, including housing will be encouraged. And there's a few policies that um, also encourage um, this type of residential, which we'll discuss also in key issue one. Consistent with that land use, um, the zoning is BC1, business community, and the density is determined through open space, in this case, 1,200 square feet of open space per dwelling unit for uses. And it's important to note that attached residential is con conditionally permitted. The memo erroneously notes um, that it's um, a limited one use, but similar to a limited one use, conditional use in this case, uh, requires a use review for ground floor residential. And then there's some limits on certain non-residential uses uh, to 10% of the total site review floor area if it's things like certain types of offices, medical, dental, that sort of thing. Um, and then it's important to note that <clears throat> restaurants and retail uses are allowed by right. Office can only make up 50% of the total floor area. These are some of the newer code changes that came out through the uh, use table. And then it's important to note that both BC1 and BC2 zoning are considered to be consistent under the community business land use. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we get into the key issues. It's helpful to take a look at the context and just to spread it across the screen. And, and in this case, um, it's reflective of the zoning. So there's uh, quite a bit of community business types of uses that include the Safeway across the street and then um, a shopping center diagonally across um, Iris and 28th Street. Uh, there's also the multifamily residential of the Aspen Grove condominiums to the north. And then, of course, the site is attached to the rest of the diagonal plaza shopping center um, with retail and then residential uses are also found on the east and south of the site. So then zooming into this site, it's 9.26 acres. It's roughly L-shaped. It's primarily large surface parking lots. Um, and there's one retail building that today houses Walgreens on the north and then a former sports authority space. It's on the south end. It's vacant at this time. Uh, the south portion of this proposed site is occupied by uh, Boulder Housing Partners Diagonal Court Apartments, their townhomes and apartments, and it's um, there's 30 permanently affordable apartments. They were recently upgraded along with an addition of a community center and playground, as you can see in the lower right there. So the main part of the site is a separate ownership from the other retail buildings that comprise Diagonal plaza shopping center. And as you can see um, through this um, rough overlay of parcels, there's multiple uh, property owners. Um, and that's been one of the challenges in redeveloping Diagonal Plaza or upgrading Diagonal Plaza over time is the fact that there are quite a number of property ownerships. So for this um, particular um, project, the, the applicant's proposing to redevelop that existing L-shaped property, um, infilling it that connects to that existing BHP property on the south. There's uh, two east-west streets that are proposed and a north-south connector street. Seven buildings are proposed that are comprised primarily of attached residential. There's some ground floor retail and amenity spaces along with a uh, large community garden and park. Um, along with uh, on-site on structured parking and tuck under parking in some circumstances. And the buildings are intended to be built up to the street in a compact urban configuration. The applicant presented uh, two different options. Both options are intended to have ground floor retail in buildings one and two adjacent to 28th Street and amenity spaces on the ground floor of that building five. Um, and then Option two that you see on the right side um, is um, intended to provide a fourth story that has 
um, 18 additional residential units in that building five and six additional affordable units. Um, option two also has um, additional units in buildings six and seven. So it ranges from 235 residential units, 58 of which would be uh, permanently affordable on site. And then option two is 259 units, 64 of which is on site permanently affordable. So for key issue number one, um, as we've noted, the uh, dwelling units that are proposed uh, today exceed the current zoning. And so under the BC1 zoning and plan configuration um, on this site, on this 9.7 acre site, approximately 6.5 acres of open space would be required. And, and so you'd only get about 56 uh, residential units out of that. So one of the said suggestions that came from the applicant's packet is to rezone to BC2. And so in that regard, it's um, noted that BC1 and 2 are the zoning that implement that community business land use. And while they both have the same definition and both don't have a floor area ratio maximum for non-residential, uh, the BC2 has a residential density standard that permits half of the open space per dwelling unit or 600 square feet. Um, and that is allowed to go to 400 square feet per dwelling unit as open space if it's proposed as a mixed use development. So that would seem to be a good opportunity, but the, the challenge of rezoning to BC2 is that it changes the zoning map um, and those decisions are quasi-judicial in nature and they have to demonstrate that it'd be consistent with the policies and goals of the BPCP and that it has to meet one of those six rezoning criteria and generally rezoning is discouraged in the city and that top line that you see of highlighted text um, that's citing that code section. Um, the city's zoning is a result of detailed and comprehensive appraisal of the city's present and future land use allocation needs. And so the criteria that's typically applied to rezonings is that number one criteria. The applicant demonstrates that rezoning is necessary to come into compliance with the BBCP map. So the challenge of course is that that higher intensity BBCP is already in compliance with the, the land use designation. And so this criteria wouldn't apply. It's a pretty unusual circumstance. And, and staff discussed that there may be mechanisms that the city could explore in general, such as adding a rezoning criteria that addresses this type of circumstance where both of the applicable zoning districts are consistent with the comp plan. Um, or maybe look at opportunities in the community benefit code changes. Uh, the current code wouldn't allow rezoning to BC2 is the bottom line. So then the applicant had suggested a mixed use business land use that could be um, compatible to a BMS or MU4 zoning. And both of them would require a request for a comp plan land use change along with rezoning to a higher intensity zone that would be evaluated comprehensively, again, back to that first rezoning criteria. So it's important to note that there is a process to request a land use map change at any time, and it's um, when it's particularly related to rezoning, and that the relevant criteria is to determine on balance if the change is consistent with the policy's intent of the comp plan. And so that's part of what our discussion is about this evening, is to rezone or to change the land use it, we need to look to the comp plan for clues that it, it might be appropriate in this location. And so staff um, looked at the core values that are in the comp plan that articulate intent and the applicant would need to address. And inherent in these values is that development is compact, contiguous, and infill. And that supports um, evolution to a more sustainable urban form. And so in that regard, there's policies such as 2.03 that highlights the city's preferred uh, redevelopment and infill. And you can see clearly this site's an infill site. And policy 1.10 jobs housing balance, uh, which indicates that the city will seek opportunities to improve the balance of jobs and housing and that this will be accomplished by encouraging new housing and mixed use neighborhoods in areas close to where people work in um, essentially encouraging transit oriented 
develop in inappropriate locations. And so you see this heat lamp on the left that illustrates um, to um, uh, half, half a mile up to two mile radius from the site of jobs that are either easily walkable or accessed by bus or bike. And then similarly, policy 7.11 indicates that the city will explore policies and programs to increase housing for Boulder workers and their families by fostering mixed use and multifamily development in proximity to transit, employment or services, and by considering the conversion of commercial land to allow future residential. So uh, there's policies that really highlight the city's desire to create opportunities for mixed use and multifamily, um, particularly near transit and employment um, and other services. And in that regard, of course, um, we're in a context where there's uh, a fairly transit rich um, setting and 2.16 uh, mixed use for higher density development also helps to target what locations might be appropriate for housing. And it indicates the, the city's desire to encourage, uh, again, mixed use and higher density development to incorporate a substantial amount of affordable housing. Um, and in this case, not only are jobs proximate to the site um, and services, uh, but also, um, as noted, there's uh, significant um, opportunities for alt modes of travel. And then um, it's also important to note down here um, under 2.16 that uh, it indicates that there's an openness um, by the city to create new zoning districts, revisions to FARs or open space and parking requirements as the challenge is here to achieve that mixed use. And then the comp plan not only recognizes Diagonal Plaza as a center, it specifically notes Diagonal Plaza for revitalization opportunities. And in an effort to explore strategies to revitalize Diagonal Plaza, it's been looked at for quite a number of years. Uh, about 10 years ago, the council requested assistance of an Urban Land Institute Technical Advisory Panel, or a TAP. And in this case, there were seven ULI members with extensive experience in mixed use development. And they provided findings on how best to achieve revitalization and noted several factors that we're discussing tonight um, that include that um, highly used transit context and surroundings with services. They also observed that in 2011 and they noted the challenges of implementing the changes given the fragmented ownership and they recommended um, an incremental approach, uh, essentially to look at partnerships between the properties and the adjacent uh, Boulder housing partners, not unlike the concept plan tonight. So then for key issue number two, um, at concept plan, staff and planning board are expected to provide some feedback to the applicant on their plans. And staff noted in the memo that the proposed configuration of those streets is in keeping with both that ULI TAP recommended um, main street configuration, but also a modified grid pattern of streets that are in that North 28th Street Transportation Network plan. Then with regard to the architecture and the building forward approach to the concept plans, it's also in keeping with the TAP recommendations for that main street approach um, that has buildings built up to the street and a low speed north south street creation of public spaces um, in a relatively urban context as is shown in the concept plan. Obviously, it's gonna be a pretty distinctive change between what's there today. Uh, so then a staff notes that by infilling these broad parking lots, it's in keeping with those BBCP policies we talked about, creating a sense of place. And in that regard, staff also wanted to talk about some opportunities that might exist with the plan and particularly with regard to that um, south end of the site. Um, what's shown there today obviously is a um, pretty significant, um, essentially a blighted space. Um, and so obviously having an improved context with a community garden as a focal point coming in from 28th is um, a good approach. One of the things though, that as you get closer to the site that staff noted is that there's also parking lots that uh, surround that garden space. And so when we take a look at a diagram of this, you can see that 
Um, this wonderful asset that's being considered is essentially surrounded by the existing parking for that existing BHP um, diagonal court townhomes, as well as proposed parking surrounding, including the tuck under parking. And then one suggestion is that the applicant take a look at maybe um, changing that up a little bit to frame it and essentially create a, a community garden space that all the units could look out onto and then move the parking out to the periphery, maybe consider uh, solar carports, but either way, creating a better seam and um, essentially stitching those two sites together. Um, and then in terms of the architecture, the applicant presented some renderings that um, are noted to be a contemporary in form and in materials and um, also had the appearance of being somewhat boxy. And one of the pushbacks we've heard recently is ensuring that there's more variety in the building forms. One of the uh, advantages in this particular case is that it's part of Appendix J where height modifications can be considered. And so staff suggests that at least some of the building forms consider using a pitched roof form as is shown in the precedent images. Uh, with that public notification, it's important to note that it was um, the signs were posted for a minimum of 10 days and public notice was sent to property owners within 600 feet. We received one public comment that appeared to be related more to a concern about Diagonal Plaza being in Appendix J. Um, and then there were several additional comment letters that were sent to Planning Board and one to Council that appeared to indicate support, strong support for housing. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, everything is on my screen and I was trying to move my cursor around to unmute. Thank you so much, Elaine, for that presentation. Uh, so now we'll open it up to board questions and um, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, since we go late, I'll just remind for my own good and everybody else's that um, it's always best to make sure that you are posing a question so that we uh, can save our, you know, comments for later and that'll make best use of our time. And that's just as much for me as anyone else. So with that, I saw Georgie's hand and I saw Sarah's hand. So Georgie. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I just had a quick question. I, I saw the units proposed are affordable in workforce. I, I'm, I'm familiar with what affordable housing means. Can you define what workforce housing means? So it's, it's not luxury and it's not affordable. And it's a term that's used in our comprehensive plan. Um, in fact, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and reshare. Um, I know this came up for uh, planning board member, Sarah Silver as a concern. In this particular case, it um, is in the housing section and it uh, describes employer workforce housing needs, um, and then also creating a diversity of housing types. Um, and the workforce housing terminology is essentially like a, um, an industry standard. And it implies, again, that we're not looking at um, luxury types of units. We're not looking at permanently affordable units. We're looking at those who might be employed within the community. Um, and I know that there's some confusion around that, but when we're looking at um, potentially talking about a concept plan that would require rezoning and one that would also mean um, we need to look to the future guidance of the comp plan policies and, um, and specifically look at um, those that are related to providing housing, um, we're, we're looking and we're talking tonight about comp plan policies. That normally wouldn't be as large of an emphasis when we're in site review, but tonight, because we're entertaining an idea that it could be a rezoning or a land use change, both of those really hinge upon having um, an understanding of what the comp plan would suggest. So that's a, a pretty long route to just get to the point of workforce housing yeah, is something that's part of the comp plan terribly clear on that, on what param what what actual parameters the city has over defining workforce housing, meaning that this was to be developed and we were expecting 
one thing, but you got luxury finishes and higher end apartments in there. What, what do we have controls over that? Is that, is that why that's defined or is that, I, I'm, I'm unclear as to what, what that really means. Well, I think it means market rate housing. So there could be opportunities for um, luxury apartments there as well. But the point is in this particular case, the applicant is proposing um, on-site permanently affordable residential. And uh, so at 25% on-site. So that's the only thing that I think we're locking in in this concept plan. Everything else is considered um, based on the market. Okay, so I, just to be just to be clear, because it feels it, workforce as a term feels like a sell if there's really no controls over what it means. So just just from the standpoint of clarity for the public, the city of Boulder has no control over what workforce housing means, and these apartments that are positioned in that part of the conceptual plan are strictly apartments being developed. And it's up to the developer to develop those apartments and the finishes within them, not in the, in the, in the rents, et cetera, right? With the exception of the affordable housing piece, that's correct. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't talking about the affordable. I, I understand the definition of affordable housing. I was, it, it just, I, I'm just trying to clarify that the term workforce as it represents here is no different than just a market rate apartment. Yeah, and that could be, but again, I, I point to our comp plan that does utilize that terminology. And I think the intent is to be um, something that's provided not for a retiree or not for luxury, but for those who are in the workforce. And there's a huge spectrum of those in the workforce, but, um, and you know, this is also because it was in the agenda title, this was extracted from the applicant's um, description. So I think we should also defer to the applicant to tell us what they're proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. I, I know there's been a lot of interest in that. Sarah? Um, so uh, I'm, I have some questions that have to do with open space. Um, so it's sort of two different um, questions, but they're both about open space. The first is um, about this, the efficiencies, and Elaine, I had emailed you about that earlier today. In the city code, the, the efficiencies are defined as uh, apartments under 450 square feet with certain uh, uh, parameters. Uh, and efficiencies allow you to have two efficiencies to equal one dwelling unit. So I was curious about uh, but the efficiencies in this proposal are larger than that. So I'm curious to understand what the implications are um, for uh, um, open space with that incorrect code labeling of those apartments. And then the second open space question has to do with, um, I was really confused. Uh, the, the, the proposal seemed to at be asking if the open space, the total open space requirement might be redefinable. <laughs> might be recalculated uh, by including the open space that exists in the existing Boulder housing partner townhome development or uh, by uh, counting 100% of uh, the rooftop decks rather than 25%. Um, and so that just seemed like, um, that seemed like sort of a special request and I wanted to understand how staff uh, here's those requests and what you all are thinking. Yeah, okay, so I'll start with that second question. Um, we've had the discussion that given the fact that we're in community benefit um, code changes, that maybe there's an opportunity to look at um, allowing things like a roof top garden and deck, which is clearly open space to count more at 100%. And that maybe there's opportunities to do that if in exchange we get <clears throat> um, a certain percentage of, of 
affordable housing or more residential units or what have you. Um, and I think the opportunity to pull in the um, Boulder Housing Partners piece that does actually have more of a park setting um, to be able to utilize that and then mesh that into uh, the community park and garden that's proposed as I shown in a diagram that maybe you could pull those together could create a more seamless open space opportunity. <clears throat> so uh, I don't know if that answers that question, but I'll go back to the efficiency living units if you'd like. Okay, can I, let me just follow up on this one topic. So have, I'm assuming that the open space for the existing Boulder Housing Partner townhomes was already calculated at some point to meet the open space requirements for that development. Mm -hmm. So is it have is there some precedent for recounting that open space uh, that's already been counted for one development to benefit another development? Uh, that because that's what I'm hearing you. That's what I'm hearing you saying. Well, I don't think it would be recounting it. In other words, this would be united as one site review. And again, that's why those ideas and that diagram showing how these could be more seamlessly transitioned would be a more meaningful use of that open space. So I don't see necessarily a problem with, um, if we're looking to find housing opportunities and we have to build a six acre park in order to get you know, um, 50 units that we not look at opportunities. I, I don't see any harm in not looking at opportunities to create um, interesting open space areas and open space areas that are sort of married together. And that would have to be something that would be part of a code change um, and would be re, re, uh, united through a site review. Um, but I'll go on to the um, other question about efficiency living units. They're actually at 475 square feet. That's how the code defines them. And so they're, they're a little over that at 500 square feet of what they're showing. But yes, um, the code also says that two efficiency living units essentially equals one dwelling unit for purposes of calculating things like open space or parking or um, what have you. So, so yeah, that's equivalent to two, two, two efficiency living units are equivalent to one dwelling unit. So you're correct. So as you all, um, so one follow up. So as you all look at that, is are you also expecting to get a request from the applicant to re renegotiate what defines a, a, an efficiency dwelling unit up to 500 so that they don't have the implications of more open space requirements and more parking requirements or are you, pushing them to reduce the size of the apartments to the what the code says. I'm just They've not understand. made any kind of um, indication in the packet. And we could certainly ask them that question, but they didn't have anything in the packet to suggest that they wanted to increase the, the size of efficiency living units. That's not something that we've entertained or considered. Um, so they, if they did want to stay with the uh, efficiency living units, they would just have to be in compliance with the defined size and square footage. Okay, thank you. Makes sense. Okay, any uh, other questions for Elaine from anyone else? I just um, wanted to, I, I think maybe some people would be interested in, uh, is, is there any uh, way that um, the rest of the diagonal site could be considered for land use and rezoning changes? Uh, uh, you know, in the time frame that we're thinking about it for this site, or is that kind of off the table because of the land ownership? I, I just wasn't sure if there are opportunities to, to look at some of those other areas that we eventually expect to be redeveloped. Yeah, and I, I think if we consider or entertain those code changes that have to do with the BC zoning district, it would impact the rest of Diagonal Plaza, and maybe that would be um, enough impetus for those 15 or so property owners to, to be able to participate. And we'd of course want the support of the property owners. And if something like that were to occur, we would have to have outreach and um, discussions with them as stakeholders. Okay, and, either, and in either of those cases following a land use and zoning 
re rezoning, land use change and rezoning, uh, we'd be talking about potentially longer, you know, significantly longer time frames to get to a site review, I guess. Uh, I, would you say that's fair? Yep, that is fair. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, Sarah. Uh, one last question. So you walked us through the proposals that the applicant has made on potential land use changes. Uh, could we offer up an idea for a land use uh, change? We're, okay. we're in concept plan review, so yeah. Great. Okay, when we get there, I'm going to do that. It's going to be a very interesting deliberation. <laughs> uh, we have a number of moving parts here, so uh, there will probably be a lot of note taking. Uh, any other questions? All right, well, that's, uh, that's great. Um, so let's move on then to uh, uh, the applicant presentation. Um, let me check my notes here. Uh, I think I have you down. I apologize. I'm looking for the time that I took a, took the note uh, notes on. Uh, was it 15 or 20 minutes for this? I think we'll we'll try to get it done in 15 if we can, David. That was what we were planning on. So that's great. So um, Bill, I guess you'll be kicking us off. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Jarvi um, from TCR and Laura from BHP to start us. Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Board and Lane. Thank you very much for that uh, thorough presentation. Uh, I just want to do a quick info. I'll be brief uh, so that our team can focus on, on the property details and questions. I think it, it's been said, given the property history here, it's extremely challenging to get control of a property like this. Part of the challenge is dealing with you know, surrounding owners as well as covenants that date back to the 1960s. Since going under contract on this property, we've spoken to every single owner and are nearing an amended covenant that really improves ownership, access, et cetera, for each of the owners. And, and each of those owners are also very thrilled uh, by the potential of redeveloping. As you've looked at an area or the Western portion of this property has largely been ignored. Um, I also thought I'd highlight a couple of our goals for this project. Uh, we obviously aim to create affordable housing opportunities on the property. We'd like to re redevelop or excuse me, re revitalize what is a, a retail center that, as you all have seen, is, is, is near dilapidation. But also aiming to provide with smaller, more affordable housing in the city's core, as well as to create community space uh, for, for the existing community as well as for the future community. I think probably most importantly, as Elaine alluded to, um, we formed an essential partnership with Boulder Housing Partners to, to dedicate land, to provide them with an opportunity to enhance their existing campus to really expand on that aspect of development. I'll turn it over to Laura Scheinbaum, who's the Director of Real Estate Development for Boulder Housing Partners. And then as Bill mentioned, Bill will continue on uh, with, with more in-depth detail on, on the actual specifics of the property. But I wanna say in advance, thanks for everybody for your time. Uh, and we look forward to discussing this opportunity with you all. So Laura, I'll hand it over to you and uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Jarvie, and uh, thank you, Elaine. Um, good evening, Planning Board. Uh, thanks, Bill. I'm Laura Scheinbaum with Boulder Housing Partners. Happy to be here tonight. Uh, BHP is the city's housing authority. Uh, we own, manage, and develop permanently affordable housing all over the city, and then we own that in perpetuity. Um, and so I am super pleased to be here tonight as partner to Trammell Crow and Jarvie's team for the provision of uh, affordable housing for this project. Um, and I'm super also excited about this project for a number of reasons. I'm a longtime Boulder resident, and this is a tremendous opportunity to place make in a Grayfield site. Um, we've all seen how sort of dilapidated, I think the word was before blighted, um, that, that parking area is. Um, and secondly, and important to BHP, and has already been discussed by Elaine, um, we do own, BHP owns 30 permanently affordable units to the south of this opportunity. Um, it's a property that's a bit of an island. <clears throat> it's got that, um, parking, blighted parking lot to the north. Um, it struggles with pedestrian and vehicular access to the property. Um, and it's just uh, really not a, a great location for the families that live there. So when I then take the, and morph that parking lot that's currently blighted and turn it into an affordable housing campus that would include new affordable housing, a park, sidewalks, um, better defined drive paths, landscaping, shared amenities, um, I can really start to envision something that is really beautiful um, and, and really well served for current and future residents there. 
So thank you for your time. Um, I look forward to hearing your input and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill to walk you through the architecture. Thanks. Thanks. Bill Holicky with Coburn Architecture. So um, Elaine did a nice job of um, walking through the context. Uh, this is all the, the connections and the surrounding residential context. So I won't go into that. Um, I will um, answer some of Sarah's questions because uh, that they were insightful and exactly the same as ours. So when we initially submitted our pre-app to the city, um, as Elaine noted, it was full of like, how could this happen, right? Should, could it be rezoned? Could the uh, underlying zone change? Is there you know, a, a way that the zone itself could change? And staff's response, which was um, pretty visionary uh, to us, was to say, don't worry about that yet. Design what could go here. Think about what this could be, and we'll take it to planning board and council, and then talk about the mechanisms that could get them to a result they want. So we kind of abandon all of the proposals for this zone or that zone, and we're not pushing any of that tonight. We also um, did not continue to explore looking at maybe two efficiencies, counting it as one unit and therefore needing less open space. So we intended to, to change our um, all of our charts to just say this is how many units, right? There's no two to one anything. Um, so the proposal is 259 actual units, not city of Boulder equivalencies or anything like that, with the intention of having a real conversation of saying, is this a good vision? And if it is, how do we accomplish that as a community? So um, Elaine talked a lot about the comp plan and I will focus on the TMP because that gives us the framework for how the vision sits in the code um, in terms of how this physically develops, which is of course more my world than the code. Um, so the, the purple are the roads in the TMP uh, and the green is this bike path that comes up and kind of dies into the site. And we walked through this with staff, talked in the pre-app, talked with transportation, and um, it became pretty clear that most of this can work pretty well. The, the road that's shown on the left-hand side that goes north-south through the DMV, and the idea in the TMP is that the east-west roads are more major, north-south or, or more um, secondary. That one is a problem. It goes right through somebody's site. So um, in those conversations, we kind of came up with this alternative tweak, which is what Elaine's talking about. We're, we're matching more of the alternative plan in the TMP, where that western one becomes a north-south multimodal corridor, still providing connection. If we do that, then it can be on this site. This site can provide that connection. It doesn't have to wait for a future development um, through that neighboring uh, building. But the east-west roads, the more important roads, uh, work with the rest of the site that's in place now. And also really cr really critically on this site, it also works with all the easements and utilities. Um, I have, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I've never seen legal entwinements like this before. There's 15 property owners, there's cross easements and it's crazy. Um, but these are the main ones and they also work with the TMP East West roads. So when you put those things together, you end up with a road framework um, that supports that. And I'm trying to get this to fast forward here. Um, so that, that road framework can go into place and then the buildings get laid in around the road framework. So everything was based off the TMP to create this, this end result um, of real streets uh, per the division document of the city. Um, the reason those streets um, are walkable and human scaled is because we've, unlike the current property, which is all parking lots, all the parking is tucked behind the buildings. So this is an exploded diagram that um, will pop up on your screen. In the upper left is the building as it sits on the site. On the middle, we've taken the top off the building and kind of popped it up in the air so you can look in at the first floor. All of the parking is tucked behind retail or community space or live or work or in the Boulder Housing Partners section uh, behind that residential fabric. Um, I'll also note in this that we've been making changes as we've, as we've heard from staff. We've changed, uh, heard the, the staff comments about Boulder Housing Partners units coming up to the park. So that has been modified, at least as a start, so those units come up to the park. And again, it's concept plan. So this is a dialogue um, between us and staff and the community and, and you guys and council. So it will continue to evolve. Um, we're very early in the process. So this is a diagram of how those streets lay into the overall network. And those blue streets are the main east-west streets in the transportation master plan. Yellow are the cross streets. And this multi-use path is what we're relocating so it can go all the way up to Iris right now. Um, but what, what's kind of neat about this is the western side of the site is the really bad side of the site. And um, wasn't really apparent to us until we started working on it and drawing on it. But 
uh, compared to the way the site is right now, the whole western side is entirely paved. There's not a, not a square foot of open space on it. Um, when we make this change, if we were to put a project here, if we all agreed on what should go here, it has a couple of impacts. The first is it elevates the entire area because it takes the worst part of the area and makes it the best part. So now the whole area gets better. The other thing it does is put in the framework for future changes. So uh, you can see from this that even if those big box stores in the middle didn't change, they would still have a pseudo road to front on now on the north, or they could add residential, I'm sorry, retail frontage on the south and form a complete street with what's going in in front of the Boulder Housing Partners stuff. The parking lot to the north could also redevelop into mixed use or residential and would have a real street to do that on. So it, it really does support that incremental change that um, Elaine was talking about the city focusing on. The other thing that's interesting since we started doing this is we have been doing a lot of outreach. And um, this is a question for planning board tonight. One of the things we're hearing is what Elaine was saying that perhaps this is an area that we're not as worried about limited four stories. Uh, we've kind of drawn everything as kind of three stories everywhere. Um, but maybe the maybe what we are hearing pushback on is, you know what, maybe um, we can do this in a way that's not, it doesn't look like somebody took a three-story box and filled it up with everything that could be built there. So can we modulate? Can we bring some of it up a little bit, some of it down a little bit? So we, we flipped around the middle of this, you probably noticed, so that along 28th Street, that roof deck opens to it. Um, so it changes as you go down 28th Street. It's a little bit of a three-story and then down to one story and then back to three-story and then there's a street. So there's not a three-story wall on 28th Street, it moves around. So one of the questions for planning board is, should we continue to pursue this and maybe take other parts of the buildings up, maybe building four or part of building three? So it's partially a four-story building and drop other parts of it down to two stories and then get in some pitched roofs so that it's more of a modulated or moving around massing. So, question for planning board as we move forward. Um, so the Boulder Housing Partners section is another part that's uh, really a big deal and we're excited about because right now, as, as Laura mentioned, you can't get to it on a sidewalk at all. You can't drive to it on a road. You have to go through a dirt parking lot. You can't bike there. So with the change, all of a sudden it's engaging the Boulder Housing Partners section into the overall community fabric because there's a real road. And then with the provision of the new Boulder Housing Partner units and a park um, that's shared with the community building, so now the old and new parts are sharing amenities, you can actually bike or drive or walk, God forbid, on a sidewalk to get out into the greater community. So I know that's something Boulder Housing Partners is excited about, and it's a, it's a big change for the area. Um, I won't dwell on these next two slides because Elaine has kind of gone over it, but I'm happy to go into in more detail um, the, the units, if anybody would like to get into that. But again, everything is pretty preliminary in terms of you know, the size of the efficiencies and that kind of thing. We would make that work with city codes, whatever the appropriate um, point is. But the first floor hidden parking, second floor uh, residential above. Um, for the architecture, we talked about this a little bit, but it's not at all set in stone. We don't know what it is. Um, we want planning board to tell us what they think. The only thing we really focused on was the first floor and the idea of trying to make these human scale streets. Um, Everything else is up in the air and I would love to get your feedback. For open space, again, right now, the entire site is either paved or building. There's no green at all. And so in this context, we'd be introducing this. It's likely that we'd be ha we would have more highly designed um, green areas and less like leftover lawn, more actually designed in green spaces and gardens, so forth. So feedback again on the types of green space um, would be helpful. We're really interested in a community garden, for example. It would be used not by just by BHP, but by everybody in the area. Um, and lastly, the building architecture. Again, the upper levels are just cloudy for now. That's purposeful. We really want to focus on making great places on the first floor. Um, you've heard this from me before, but it's super critical. The first 14 feet make all the difference in how you perceive a street and walk along it. Um, so again, we focused on the street kind of up to the 14th foot level, and then everything else um, is still very much up in the air since we're so early in concept. I'd like to get some feedback on that. So that's the architecture and planning, and Danica um, will walk us through some of the bigger community conversations. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'm Danica Powell with Trestle Strategy Group. I'm excited to be here tonight. I've lived in this neighborhood for two decades and have stared at this blank space for many years, wondering what it could be. So as you can see in this um, rendering, there's a real emphasis on the streets, creating uh, safe streets, complete streets, 
pedestrian walkability, a lot of transparency, um, neighborhood retail. And so the, as Bill mentioned, those were kind of the first um, key elements that we laid out. This is a view of the um, open space, shared open space amenity. So the idea is that is it shared with the whole community. It's also um, carefully placed to connect the existing community center for, uh, for um, Boulder housing partners. Um, I have a dream has a program there and it's an incredible community center that exists, but there's no green space. So this community green space will serve both BHP existing residents, future residents and the larger community. And I'd love to work with the BHP residents to talk about what they'd like to see in that as we move forward in this project. Um, here's another view of the first floor architecture. As you can see, lots of transparency, great articulation, and a lot of walkability that does not exist today anywhere on the site. And finally, the community benefits are really important on any project in Boulder. So just quickly, a lot of on-site affordable housing, that is tough to do. And this is a great opportunity to create more affordable housing next to existing affordable housing. Um, community space for the future and existing community, smaller affordable units. There's no displacement of any small businesses or commercial tenants in this proposal. In fact, we hope that we will keep those small tenants and our other retail anchors in the space for long-term revitalization, increased sales and use tax for the community, um, for the city, lots of transportation connections, implementation of the TMP, which has been long looking to create connections through the site, a neighborhood park, and my most favorite is reduction of impervious services and improved water quality. The site is a mess when it comes to runoff and storm water quality. And so this will definitely change that and make it a much more beautiful, um, safe space from a water quality standpoint. And finally, here's an image of um, another streetscape and showing that really wonderful landscaping along the street and all the amenities and people that already live in the neighborhood that are excited to have a place to walk to and um, a visit. So that's it for our presentation. Bill, do you have any final words? Oh, thank you. I appreciate your, uh, look forward to your questions and, and your ideas. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for that uh, presentation. Um, so yes, let's open it up then to questions from the planning board to, uh, to anyone on the applicant group. Uh, anyone want to start us off? Sarah. Um, thanks so much for that uh, presentation. And I'm excited that we're having a dialogue. That is fun for us. Um, I actually have a question that, uh, that has to do with the opportunity zone. This is actually the first project that has come to us that is firmly fully placed within the opportunity zone. And I just would be curious um, what, what that has meant for this process for you. So Bill, I assume you want me to take that one. I, I, what I would say about that, Sarah, it's a great question. The, but the opportunity on the, on the front end of it is it probably increased the, the, the property value that I want under contract on, given the opportunities and benefits. Um, I think it, it, it likely expands on some of, of the benefits for long-term ownership of the property, as well as the, you know, the, the investment uh, vehicles that go into that property. I think more importantly, it, it does... Um, create a, a sense of urgency. I don't know how familiar everybody is with the Opportunity Zone benefits. Uh, I won't go, that's a different conversation. I won't go in too far into the weeds, uh, but they, they, they um, degrade over time. The, the benefits of the investment in the Opportunity Zone, um, you know, subtly kind of uh, start to fade away. So there is, it does present some, some urgency in, in uh, the opportunity. Sarah, I, I just want to follow up. So is there, do you all have a time frame in your heads that you would like the, uh, our processes to be completed by? Is this fast as possible, uh, uh, fair <laughs> answer? Um, it, it, actually, the, I mentioned at the, at the intro, uh, the, the tighter constraints is just with, with the property owner, frankly. Um, it, it's, it's been a long, t it's taken a long time to, for the, for the owner of this property to get comfortable with selling, uh, the property. Uh, we've got, you know, tight, tight windows to get through that and execute through that, um, for fear of, of the opportunity going away. So the, the, the opportunity here is really a catalyst, as Bill mentioned, uh, to further development. We, you know, the question came up about 
future owners. We think that that's that there's great opportunity for that. Uh, but really, you know, we're acting on what we control, and we're trying to develop a plan that can can really expand. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions? Lupita. I am mute. Um, so I'm I'm wondering since we're we talking about uh, the workforce. And now we have a, a number of owners. I'm wondering if in the discussions you had with the community, there was some uh, where specifically talked to, now that we're talking about residential buildings here, would this particular owners will see themselves living in the, in the housing that now are being proposed? Is there something that, you know, where we're gonna more target it potentially trigger you know the that that imbalance that we've been trying to to decrease you know people coming into into work onto uh boulder but cannot live here so knowing that we do have businesses already there was there any discussion about that whether it's specifically this would be people this is the kind of housing that will appeal to us and or our workers you know and I, i'm not i'm not talking about just the owners i mean the, the workers themselves if you can speak to the, to that at all, if you if you came up, I, I think specific specific to the conversations with the surrounding owners, uh, there was just an overwhelming excitement for redevelopment uh, of the western portion of the property. Uh, the opportunity for in you know nearby housing was certainly an aspect of that. Um, and, and actually the opportunity of, of a range of different housing. As, as Bill pointed out, um, we'll be creating additional uh, opportunities within the, the retail frontage on 28th Street. We have close to you know, 30,000 square feet um, proposed. So certainly we'll create an opportunity for those workers to live in, our, in, in, both, in both aspects of the community. We, we, we frankly, we did not go into a grave detail except for the, the overwhelming excitement from the surrounding owners Certainly, uh, it, you know, the, the redevelopment presents an opportunity for their businesses to flourish. I think that's probably uh, one of the more exciting aspects of it because the, the old adage of, of you know, retail follows uh, rooftops, the, the critical mass of, of population that will be created will certainly help those businesses thrive. Danica, did you want to, you have your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I did that on purpose. Um, I just want to say anecdotally, like I said, I live in this neighborhood. I walk to Murphy's, I walk to those, those the restaurant and I've talked to the people at the sushi restaurant and I think you know they all commute in from outside and so when I talked to them about housing being nearby um, that they could possibly afford it, there was a lot of interest so I think that there are a lot of employees that are service employees there's a salon there's restaurants a coffee shop um, and they all would like to have housing options near where they work. So I think we can continue that dialogue and, and understand what kind of housing options they're looking for as well. But I would say anecdotally spending time in this neighborhood, almost all the, the service people working in this area are definitely commuting from outside town and it would be wonderful to have housing near their, their workplace. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that information. Even if it's anecdotal, it helps. But in, in, in regards to how you guys can move forward in your discussions, because then, then it will help us also in the definition that we were having a little bit of discussion early about this workforce uh, housing, because then it could be defined more specifically. And maybe this is, will be one site where this really becomes defined in a, in a manner that is meaningful. Because you know sometimes we have, we have definitions that are rather abstract, but if you can point out to an example how this turned out to be where you know the workforce in this area were able to afford living there, uh, maybe this will be something that it will be easier for our community to grapple, you know, put their hands around and in the future will be maybe more receptible for that. I don't know. Yeah, and, and just because you mentioned an, an example, Lupita, I'll, I'll give you one. We have, we uh, developed a property by down in Sloan, by Sloan's Lake in Denver. It's a redevelopment of the St. Anthony's Hospital. We put a restaurant tenant, uh, it's called Sloan's Tap and Burger. They also have Highland Tap and Burger and others. Uh, there were bartenders and uh, waiters and, and staff at that restaurant that occupied units in our, in our multifamily project above. So that happens regularly. It happened actually 
and our other project in in um, in the low high neighborhood. So we see that um, very typically, and, and often we 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 see retail tenants negotiate um, you know apartments for employees in, within our building as a part of the lease negotiation. So th there are practical examples where where we've seen that in the past. And then one, one last thing, I think it's really critical that we are very clear about the term workforce housing. So to the question before, workforce housing is market rate unrestricted housing. I mean, just so we're clear, there's only two restrictions in the city. There's either deed restricted affordable or there's nothing. And so I don't want anybody to think that somehow this is gonna be like deed restricted in some way. But the one tool that we do have in our toolbox is size and the open space, You know, we have a certain amount of open space per unit in, the, in a zone there right now, that tends to push you to very large units, right? Because if you can only build 10 units, people tend to want to build them as large as possible because the more square footage they build, the more square footage they can sell. So that's why we get these huge units that are unattainable units. Um, one of the purposes of, of asking you all, hey, is there a mechanism that we can go through? Is this vision of these smaller units, does that make sense? Um, is trying to get at, um, units that are smaller because smaller units are generally, well, they, they, are, they have to be cheaper than a unit in the same size that's larger. So I just wanna be clear that there's no deed restriction with a workforce. And I don't know what that term means either. I mean, it's in the code, it's not defined, but we're told, you know, that's what we gotta use. So that's what we use, but I don't know. That's a weird way of saying, I hear your pain. I don't know what the word means. So I wanna be clear about what we're talking about. Thank you, uh, Georgie. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for that that clarification. That that's that's super helpful. Um, around unit sizes, I guess my my question or comment um, that maybe you can just take back is um, what I am concerned about in Boulder is us putting a lot of tiny ELUs and smaller units in place, and ultimately, you know, getting getting in people that are that are young. And and uh, and want to work in the city and, and have roles, but then as they go through their life cycles, um, they get pushed out. And I don't perceive that we're building the uh, a lot of inventory in Boulder um, for the next step of a professional getting married, having children, and a, and a long life in Boulder. And so, what I would urge you to do from my perspective, because I, I, I didn't state this and I, I want to state this up front. I think overall, this is, this is a great project and a great idea. And the idea that you're adding housing and not focusing on office, I think aligns with a lot of the things that the community is looking for and trying to solve some of the problems. What I don't see being solved here, and I know we can't solve everything in one project, is um, trying to create a diversity of, uh, of, uh, of age groups, demographics, all, all those things combined, as I mentioned, family type spaces, um, where I hear you on the smaller spaces, because I think that makes a lot of sense, um, but creating also smaller spaces for families to occupy as well um, in different housing types. So I wanted to put that out there to you. And maybe if you can respond, great. If not, and take it back, that'd be fine too. I, I can respond. That's extremely helpful because as, as we work with staff to try to figure out a mechanism for a change that would allow this project, um, if you know that's the general feeling of planning board, what you just described, then we would stay away from a zone that would require us to you know count the two to one efficiency units, right? And instead find a zone that we're just counting units as, as units and maybe they get a little bit bigger so they're more like one bedrooms or two bedrooms so that they have a more you know, a greater variety of people to serve. So yeah, I think that's extremely helpful as we try to chart through this process. I think too, on the affordable side of things, so the, the housing that BHP owns to the South is a combination of two and three bedroom units. There's no efficiencies or one bedrooms there. It's strictly a family um, community. And then we'd be looking to extend that with the unit composition for the building to the North if we were to get there. So I think I'm looking now, um, we had kind of blaze through it before, but you know, a good number of three bedroom units, a lot of two bedroom units, just a smattering of ones and no efficiencies. So I think, um, again, trying, not that that's necessarily what you're talking about, Georgie, in terms of um, having that, that, you know, sort of next step per se, um, if it's not necessarily an affordable need, but it, um, it would be there as um, options for affordable um, family style housing with a mix of unit type. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And just one comment to that. I, I, I think what you just said makes sense on the affordable side. I was speaking more to the market rate and trying to address sort of the middle income that falls outside of affordable housing that is in desperate need of housing in Boulder that we don't really have good inventory for. But thank you. Thank you both. And that, that was that was a question. I'll give it. I, I thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, trying to keep it on questions. Uh, and um, spoiler alert, in our uh, upcoming retreat, we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that very issue of uh, middle, middle, middle income housing. Lupita. Yeah, in fact, that's where my comment was going to be because I think this is a prime opportunity for us to kind of connect the dots and say how closely can we use this space to address some of this middle uh, the missing middle, as to keep using the the the, the phrase that you know is being you know tossed around in our group for a long time. So I'm wondering to speak, we're gonna be learning more uh, in the retreat, but certainly here is an opportunity to kind of bring it up and said this is this something where um, it will get us closer to addressing the missing middle if we were to um, get more of the two bedrooms or is it, uh, and maybe this is uh, probably Sarah is the one that's been uh, advocating the most about this. So maybe she can speak a little bit to that so that you guys get uh, a little bit more specific you know, feedback from us seeing that this is a prime place for probably addressing that need. And of course, you know, the fact that you are doing some affordable housing, I always appreciate seeing that um, because we do need that still. Very much so. Peter, did you, uh, oh, did, did you want to respond to that? Um, or Peter, did you have a uh, It's not uh, on this topic, so I'm going to wait and it'll be on connectivity and it's a specific question later. I, I would, uh, David, I would just respond real quickly. Um, yeah. Laura touched a little bit on, on her property uh, and, and there was comments about this property not being luxury, I, I will tell you right now, our going in focus here is an 80 to 100% AMI price range. So, um, you know, there's a comment about the missing middle. That's that's that, that's where we're, we're targeting, as Bill mentioned, the, the smaller size of the units uh, broadly and and, and, the, and really the overall size of the project leads us to that um, uh, to that kind of conclusion and underwriting. So just wanted to, to point that out. Thank you. Great. Uh, with that, um, Peter, did you want to ask your mobility question? Sure. Besides the great topics brought up here, which are being covered well, so I'm going to let I'm going to leave leave that aside for a moment. The other thing that concerns me the most is the future adaptability to future development. I think that's a concern for everyone. And so, Bill, slide 15. You were diagramming the street and road connections. Yeah, I wonder if you could tell me if there's anything that's really in the way uh, of that that we would want to make sure we consider in our deliberation. If there's anything associated with that kind of future adaptability, that's an issue, or if it's too early for even a discussion like that. Because I wanted to make sure that we remember that we keep that kind of thing in mind. Um, definitely, definitely not too early for that conversation. I mean, I think that we're. We're basing the entire project around trying to man, you know, um, exactly what you're saying. And I'm, I'm trying to flip over. Um, if you don't mind, I'll put that slide up so we can look at it while, while I answer. Go ahead. Um, thank you. And I am not um, staff, so I'm not so good at, at this. Give me a moment and I'll get it to the right slide. The, the uh, intention um, of both the TMP and then this project would be to make sure that the streets are put in a place that allow um, for incremental development. So maybe this is a good way to look at it. Uh, the, the way the streets go in is they work really well with the existing big box stores because they front on, the, the, the parking drive that they front on is actually the same place that TMP shows a road. And that's not accidental. I mean, you know, long range transportation did that on purpose. Um, but it allows for the, the other thing that's really hard, there's a couple of, this is really nuanced, boy, the more you get into this site, the more complicated it gets. All the parking, all the uh, property boundaries run north south. They run right through the parking lots, right through the buildings and out the backside. So it's difficult to, to because some of them are half a, half a big box store, right? So the idea is with these roads in place, somebody could put a mixed use building or residential in those northern parking lots 
and it would work because the road is there or that what's currently a half road, half drive. On the south side, you could put retail along the back of those buildings of, of those big box stores, or even just give them a face on that side and it would create a complete street on that side. So while I think we'd all prefer it to, you know, be changed into something that's more walkable and human scale and has housing all over it. Um, if that doesn't happen right away, and there's reason to believe it probably wouldn't happen right away, it can happen incrementally over time, sort of slice by slice. And the further you get to the east, the better the condition currently is. So um, I, yeah, this was the whole point of this framework plan um, by matching the TMP is to allow incremental change over time. Thanks. All right. Uh, any other questions before we go on to the public comments portion of this? Great. Okay. Excellent. So now is the time then where we will turn to the public and, to, and get your ideas and your comments on this. Uh, we, I see that we have uh, 23 attendees, so um, I don't think it will be necessary to uh, reduce the amount of time that people will speak. So. Uh, we'll keep it at three minutes per person. Uh, please do try to avoid too much repetition. And, uh, um, and also when you um, start talking, if you could uh, just state your name and uh, an address or at least the neighborhood you live in. And also we like to hear if you're representing a group or if you're affiliated with any particular group that might have an interest in this. So I'll turn it over to Jean. Great, thank you, David. And I think I went through the kind of the wrong in the flurry of our, um, technical issues at the beginning of the meeting, um, the wrong slide for uh, being able to speak. You all should be able to see the raise hand uh, button at the bottom. What you don't see is a mute or unmute option until, until it's your turn and we turn that on. So don't worry, I'll, um, once it is your turn and I call on you, um, you'll be able to see a, a way to unmute. So it looks like we've got um, a number of folks with raised hands. We've got Ginger and then Kurt Nordbeck and Macon Cowles, um, Evan, F I'm gonna butcher names, I'm so sorry, I always do this, Freerich, um, and then a number of other folks. So I'm gonna try my video again, just so that we know time. Um, and if it's going slow again, then we'll use a different option. Let's see. Okay, so Ginger, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Great. Good evening, everybody. How are you? <laughs> um, I heard someone say earlier that they live in the neighborhood. Well, that describes me as well. I live in Orchard Grove on 30th and Valmont, just across the street from the area that's going to be redeveloped. And Opportunity Zone. And to my mind, I would hope Opportunity Zone means an opportunity for people who already live here. I would love to have a chance to live in that new neighborhood that you're talking about with the mixed type of housing. That sounds wonderful. My suggestion would be to have some of it designated, maybe some blocks of townhouses or, or condos for 55 and up because that describes me. I'm retired, but I was part of the workforce as you're describing it who can't really afford to live here, except you know where I found a place to live here in the trailer park. Um, but it is getting to be a little bit um, hard to maintain even this small yard and the vegetation and just the things that my a mobile home is getting older and we have to fix things constantly. So I would love to go into a new spot, maybe a townhouse that doesn't have the same upkeep and maybe not a yard even the size of mine, but maybe a terrace or a um, balcony, something like that. So I would hope you would consider, um, you know, you're considering young families, wonderful, great, please do that. Um, but also 55 and up. And you wouldn't have to maybe say memory care or anything like that, but just lower maintenance. Yeah, I can remember stuff. Anyway, um, the other thing I would suggest, having been a, a public school teacher, not here in Boulder, um, but in Westminster, you might want to um, talk to Columbine and see, because all those kids that live in this new development are probably going to go to Columbine or Uni Hill, right? So you're going to want to see what 
if they have space for how many kids and so on. Um, so that's something architectural consideration to, to take into account. Um, anyway, I love some of the photos I saw of the renderings of various styles, pitched roof, flat roof, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I, I really encourage you to think of not only the young families, which are very important, but also um, look at the school system and think of 55 and up. Thank you. Somebody else can have my 20 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. Yeah. Kurt, 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 you're up next. Excuse me, this is Cindy really quick. Ginger, can you give your last name please for the record? Oh yes, uh, Zukowski, and I live 303 Valmont, number 120 here in Orchard Grove. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, hi, Kurt Nordbeck again. Um, you, you, I am inflicting myself on you twice tonight. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm very excited to see this project. Um, I was actually involved with the 28th Street Transportation Network Plan uh, subcommittee or whatever it was called low some 20 some years ago. So it's incredibly gratifying to start to see some of that work finally um, beginning to, to take shape. And I'm really excited to see the, the transportation connections happening there. The, the community has obviously put a lot of hopes and expectations on this site. And so I think it is important to take the time to get it right, <clears throat> particularly with respect to the land use designation and the, and the zoning. I feel like CB is not an appropriate land use designation anymore. I think the market has, has clearly stated that we don't need more of um, community business in this area. And so I, I think that I would encourage you to, um, to endorse a process that looks at what is the most appropriate land use designation, even if it takes a little longer, um, to make sure that we're really getting what the community wants, which is a lot of um, moderate cost housing and with some mixed use involved too. Um, but, but take the time to, to really do that right and get the right data, uh, land use designation and the right zoning and then move forward from there. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Okay, Macon's up next. Macon, you can go ahead and speak. And then after Macon, we'll have Evan and then ML and then Don. Good evening, Planning Board. This is Macon Cole speaking. I live at 1726 Mapleton Avenue in Boulder. Let's stipulate that if we had the money and we had sufficient staff resources available and the planning department work plan were not already completely full, it would be nice to do an area plan. But we don't have the money, we don't have the staff resources or the time to do that. And the community is impatient about this site. When I served on planning board 2001 to 2006, we talked a number of times about Diagonal Plaza and how we could get it going, but we weren't able to really get anything going. In 2010, the city heard from people across our town, won't you do something about Diagonal Plaza? Lisa Morzell, Crystal Gray, Susan Osborne, Matt Applebaum, and their colleagues on council in 2010 voted unanimously to direct the city manager to proceed with the next steps of evaluating redevelopment of the Diagonal Plaza Shopping Center. The city worked with the Boulder Urban Renewal Authority and the Urban Land Institute. Reports were prepared. The property was clearly blighted and could have been condemned for a public purpose, but we did not want to force anyone's hand. Despite community support and unanimity on planning board and council, this two-year effort in 2010 and 2011 ended in failure. The overlap of utility easements, conflicting rights of way, the difficult drainage and engineering issues and the divergent interests of 15 different owners make this a very difficult site. And no area plan can change that. 
This concept plan is the first opportunity that we've had to turn the corner on Diagonal Plaza in 10 years. Please don't lard it with process. Don't put this off until we go through the bureaucratic gauntlet of an area plan. If you do that, the planning board of 2021 will lose the chance to do something really special and historic on this site. Let this site become a monument to the forethought of this planning board and the excellence of the designers. We have a housing crisis that overwhelmingly turns away new residents from our city who are not white and rich and AARP members. This is simply not sustainable. To a certain extent, this mirrors the crisis in affordable and workforce housing seen in many other places across the country. If you're to do, to do something special with this site, something historic, that will make you proud of your service long after. Tell the developer, we will support housing and density on this site up to the building height permitted by the charter if you give us new places for people to live, cascading and sheltering roofs and roof gardens, pathways and building fronts that are friendly to pedestrians, lovely outdoor spaces and vibrant courtyards and activity pockets, reimagining entirely what this site can be. Then let the designers get to work and make this something really special for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Okay, next up is Evan, followed by ML and then Don. Hi, this is Evan Fryrish. I live at 745 Arapahoe Avenue, number 103, Boulder, Colorado. And by way of disclaimer, uh, very close to this site, I also own a unit at uh, a rental unit at Remington Post, which is about, I think, 250 units. And it's one of the most affordable areas of our city. And one of the things that I did was I just looked on Zillow and drew a circle in the immediate area of this development. And I think that if, if the planning board members did the same, or is familiar in the area, there's Remington Post, there's Aspen Grove across the way. I think you're gonna find that this is one of the most affordable areas of the city for market rate housing. And one of the concerns I have, and this may be counterintuitive as a landlord, is that you're gonna make this area much more expensive by putting in housing that I estimate will be somewhere at beginning at around 650,000 to probably more like $800,000 units. Because that's what market rate means based upon what I see the developer's plans are. Now in looking, and, and they've been candid about that, affordable housing is part of it, about 25% in either um, option one or option two but the rest is gonna be market rate. When they talk about efficiency living units, again, do a, a Zillow search in Boulder and you will find that the most expensive housing per square foot are efficiently see living units. And because parents who have students in town and those kinds of things, or sometimes it's called coder housing, and developers know that whenever you put a bathroom in, a kitchen, it really adds to the expense, but they can also charge more per square foot for the units. So when I looked at the, so first thing is you gotta see the math. You gotta see the math. Um, the, uh, the Urban Land Institute huh. defines um, workforce housing as between 60 to 120% of the AMI. In Boulder, in round numbers, AMI is about a bit over 100,000 a year. And if you do your math in terms of what that means, in terms of what they can sell units for, then you start with a range of somewhere around $400,000. That's probably the efficiency living units, but probably even more. And then you start looking at the upper ends and you're gonna start seeing units that are seven, $800,000. And then I think you're gonna probably say, well, isn't this a lot like what people have criticized Boulder Junction for? So 
the, the, my main point is, is to the extent that you have control, because the, the developer is asking for more than what they have a use by right to do, then leverage it in every way possible that you can, so that we get more affordable housing. And the consequence that I see in that area, which is one of the most affordable areas, I'll reiterate that, is that you're gonna raise the property values in that area. You can sell a two bedroom unit at Remington Post for 350,000. I bet Aspen Grove is similar. Thank and it's you. probably, I'm sorry. Your time's up. Okay. Please wrap up, please. I liked the board's questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Okay, next up is ML. ML, you should be able to unmute. I just did. Good evening. My name is ML Robles. I'm an architect with Studio Points here in Boulder, where I specialize in small houses and ways to build that respond to the critical issues of our time. Let me see if I understand the issue here at the Diagonal Plaza. The existing site is either paved over with parking or holds a big box commercial building. Both of these creating a huge heat island resulting in raised ambient temperatures and liabilities for using mechanical means to achieve comfort. Furthermore, the hardscapes are impervious, which creates a liability for stormwater runoff and lack of groundwater recharge. Given the stark nature of what exists in light of the city of Boulder's climate crisis declaration, it's not a big leap to see the need for redevelopment and more importantly, intelligent redevelopment. Intelligent, however, is not guaranteed without direct accountability to climate change. We cannot expect to meet any climate actions if carbon in an embodied and emission state is not accounted for. Never once is the word carbon found in this presentation. Never once is climate action found either. Big picture, does the construction aim for zero waste, including removal of the existing building, or will all this be tipped into the landfill? Business as usual. What about intended construction strategies to get to zero waste and carbon, carbon sequestration? Not a word is mentioned. There's a mighty lot of paved and parking area proposed. Boulder doesn't seem to recognize that there are an abundance of strategies to in fact curb the climate impacts of the built environment. We routinely see projects come forth to demolish, scrape off, tip into landfills, rebuild with conventional means, pave over and move along as though our house is not on fire. Isn't it time to wake up and take action from intelligence? Big picture, climate action needs to be at the table. The BVCP core values includes a pretty specific energy, climate and waste vision. Where are these considerations in this project? You cannot take the holistic nature of climate strategies and paste them on after the fact. These need to be part of the fundamental proposal. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you, Amel. Okay, next up is Don Price, followed by Lisa Spaulding and Claudia Hanson Thiem. We need to be able to go ahead. I planned for two minutes, so I added another sentence while they were talking. That was good. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I was looking for the unmute button. So I'm Don Price, 1740 Mapleton Avenue. Um, big picture, two things to say. One is, and actually it's what Macon said, and I would like to support that. And I think what he said was, wouldn't it be great if you got this thing done instead of getting tied up in all the process and, you know, and don't make the thing, try to make the thing perfect. You know, I, I think it would be wonderful to have something done at the diagonal. Second thing is, uh, I've got two kids. We moved here in 2007, have two kids now in their early 20s who uh, went to Whittier, uh, Casey, and Boulder High School. Uh, one of them works at Ideal Market, and the other works at a Target, not in Boulder. And wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if they could actually live in Boulder? So anything that could be done to make it less expensive 
including efficiencies. I mean, who cares what the square dollars per square foot are? I would care. Do they have enough money to be able to live in Boulder? And they would care the same thing. So that's all I got to say. And it only took a minute. And I support. And my wife, Sherry, supports it. <laughs> I definitely support ML's reminder that if we don't do something that's environmentally sensitive um, to the climate, we're all going to fry, not just our kids down the road, but even those those of us who are walking around. So please listen to the environmental people. Thanks. That, was that on Elegant? Oh, that we came through on Don Price's. Yeah, that was that was Sherry Price, who's oh, my I, who's my roommate. First, <laughs> first oh, wife. Thank you for identifying. First wife. Thank you for identifying your second speaker. We appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Don and Sherry. Um, okay, next up is Lisa Spaulding. Okay, I'm going. Lisa, you should be able to go ahead. Thanks, Jean. Um, Lisa Spaulding. I live on um, University Hill on the Western Edition, and. If you start doing incremental development on the Diagonal Plaza property, you are giving up this amazing chance to build a real neighborhood, to build a neighborhood to scale that people could be really happy living in and maybe even afford. I mean, especially if you're going to rezone, you need to do the entire project at once, not this piecemeal. And I know you were told that the ULI says to do it piecemeal. Well, the ULI, in my experience, is basically working for businesses, not for the community. And I would like to thank Macon for his little history. But Macon, if you guys had forced someone's hand 10 years ago, we'd have mature landscape there now. I mean, we have Burrup. Why has the city been waiting for 21 years to do something with this? It's just, you know, it's really crazy. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, mixed use, it would be a real favor to the existing Boulder Housing Partners properties to put them in a real mixed use neighborhood, a big one. The lady who lives across the street might be able to live in live there too. And I think that RMX2 is going to promote a human scale. That's one of the most important things we can do. Get build a new neighborhood in the city proper and um, make it not like the transit village, but make it like a real neighborhood that people want to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, next up is Claudia Hansen theme followed by Phil Michael. And then we've got somebody named G-Man. So G-Man, I'd love for you to um, uh, provide your full name once you come on. Okay, let's see. Claudia, you are up. Thank you, Jean. Good evening, members of planning board. This is Claudia Hansen theme. I live in North Boulder. Um, I want to say first, I'm really excited to see a proposal for any kind of redevelopment at Diagonal Plaza and to see one that leans into our need for affordable and workforce housing, despite the underlying zoning limitations is particularly welcome. There's four quick points I want to make about the proposal tonight. So first, I really appreciate the developers looking beyond the limits of BC1 zoning, which clearly, clearly has not been serving the community here. Um, with BC2 that they've mentioned, or with one of the various kinds of mixed use zoning, we can get a lot more housing on the site. And we can really work towards the kinds of human density that fosters sidewalk life and car light living and these other things that we are really pushing in the comp plan. Um, to that end, I also hope that you will encourage and approve significant parking reductions when this project returns for site review. Second, I'm glad to see discussion of additional height on the table here, which also increases the capacity for housing on the site. Um, I hope you'll explore with the applicant the possibilities of adding 
um, height to actually more of the buildings, especially if we can count rooftop gardens and terraces towards open space requirements. I think that's a really creative solution. This is a location with relatively few neighbor conflicts, so I think we should be taking full advantage of the height option here. Third, I really like how this plan connects to the townhomes at BHP's Diagonal Court which at the moment really is an island, um, despite sharing a fence line with the apartments on Glenwood to the south. Um, it's really all on its own there, next to the parking lot. So sharing streets and open spaces with the proposed new housing is a way of integrating that small community into the fabric of the city, and I really hope the developers will build on that concept. And finally, and most importantly, I hope that you will keep this project moving along. Um, as several folks have said, the city has had at least a decade to do area planning in anticipation of redevelopment at Diagonal Plaza, and they have repeatedly chosen an incremental approach to the site. So that approach has taken a really long time to yield fruit, but now with a proposal finally in front of us, and one that really is largely in keeping with a lot of the core values of our comp plan, I think a lengthy delay at this point in time would be a massive step backwards. Thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing your discussion. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, next up is Bill Michael. Bill, you can go ahead. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you to the planning board for uh, taking these comments. And uh, I, I just want to speak briefly and voice my strong support uh, for taking action on this site um, and and I want to echo what many others have said that um, the time to do this is is now. Um, you know, I, I think that as as someone in my early 30s who's considered uh, trying to buy buy a house in Boulder and seen it, um, you know, always get further away, um, taking steps forward in in my life and and the life of my wife and and uh, and always seeing things get yeah the goalpost keeps moving. Um, I, I just would like to see many more options in Boulder for, um, I, I think there's sort of a pyramid uh, of getting in to, to the housing market that we need to have a stepping stone that's not just um, a leap to uh, owning a, a million dollar property and trying to hope that somehow the economy will work out, that, that values will continue to go up and that, that you'll all be all right. I mean, a lot of us wanna be able to to budget and plan and be ready for for a future that we know is is sustainable and stable. So um, I think that I'd really like to see Boulder be a place where um, someone can can transition from sort of being after college and, and early workforce into uh, owning a, a small a small home and then eventually and potentially moving up. But uh, I, I think this is a really kind of an existential question as to whether Boulder is going to have a, a working middle class in 10 or 20 years. I think it's not, it's not at all guaranteed that Boulder is not going to become uh, a retirement community for Silicon Valley or, or Wall Street or other, other places where people just want to live in a nice place. So um, I would strongly encourage the, the planning board to take action on this and to, to do it now and keep things moving forward. So thanks for your time. Great. Thank you, Phil. Okay, next up is G-Man. Um, I see no other hands at this point after G-Man. So if you would like to address the board, there we go, there's a few more. Okay, um, G-Man, you can go ahead. And if you could say your full name and address to G-Man when you get started. And you can probably unmute. Hey man, you should be able to unmute. Okay. Well, um, we can come back, circle back to G-Man. Looks like we've got Lynn Siegel, Gary Sprung, Rebecca Davies, and David Adamson. So let's move to, okay, Lynn, you put your hand down. Do you... Um, Okay, it's back up. <coughs> Go ahead. That was involuntary. I just decided. Yeah. So, um, 
first of all, I, I, I tend to not like to do things in a rush. And um, I don't care that this has taken 20 years. This land is highly, highly desirable. There's no problem. It's going to be developed. So don't get your panties in a stitch or whatever they call it. Um, this course housing, I don't care if Elaine McLaughlin says it's the industry standard. It's not good enough for me. We need a scale of one to 10 on the type of job and the income of the job. And then real planning can be done. And I think that is integral to any area plan or any contemplation of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan objective that Elaine brought out. I don't think that they, they can be properly evaluated unless you have some basics, basic understanding of what jobs are being created. Um, I think the linkage fee is unsustainable. It has been for a very long time. 25% is not okay. Maybe a year ago, 50% would have been okay. But now we're losing ground. Now maybe it's 70% affordable housing per project. Seriously. You know, people can say and dream about the affordable housing part, but you all know there's affordable housing here, but there's a whole lot more unaffordable housing that goes along with it, as many have said in this talk. And that unaffordable housing goes higher and higher with every affordable housing, you know, proponent that's saying, oh, good, this is getting us affordable housing because that gives you license to agree to things you shouldn't be agreeing to. Subsidies you shouldn't be agreeing to. You should not be changing the zoning inappropriately on this space. You should not be giving height density improvements. You should not give, be giving any parking reductions. You should hold out because this community and the whole nation is in a housing crisis. And you need to be responsible to addressing that. Um, I'm glad to hear about the ELUs and the small units and the way those drive up price. And I disagree with Don Price and his wife that spoke. This, this is a way to put in short-term housing for one thing. And we want long-term communities that are solid, not singles rushing through and then leaving and departing because they had something they could afford for a while and then move on. Um, let's see. Uh, we could put in heat recovery ventilators for the virus on all new build in Boulder. And this will help our economy a whole lot for restaurants and require it for schools, but there's no school on this project. Then I, um, Jean dropped off, but I've been, um, been told we're at three minutes. So if you could wrap up, that would be great. Um, Are we good? Okay, thank you so much, Lynn. Um, so since uh, Jean has dropped off, I'll go ahead. Oh, and... oh one other thing. Oh, yeah. no. No, no. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, we're past the time. Um, so let's go with, um, has G-Man been able to unmute? Or um, otherwise we'll go on to Gary Sprung, followed by Rebecca Davies and Dave, David Adam Adamson. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you, Gary, and you can unmute. You can just tell us. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Um, I'm excited about this project. I live at uh, 3675 Aspen Court, about a mile away. And I ride my bike to that area easily and often. It really makes it, it seems like it's, it's transportation connections are really pretty good, uh, about as good as it gets. And uh, so that, that makes it awesome, you know, great place for a lot of housing. And I'm very much in favor of the housing aspect of this and the more we can get the better. Um, and I think it's Evan's point about the prices being likely to be very high anyway is correct. What can we do about that? Um, we don't really have much of a mechanism to deal with the fact that the more you make a nice community, the more wealthier people want to live here. You have good schools, wealthier people want to be there. Good open space, well, wealthier people. So they outcompete less wealthy people. Prices go up. What can we do about this gentrification? Um, there's not good government mechanisms. The number one thing we've done is saying we need more supply, supply and demand. Absolutely, we need. So I, I'm in favor of trying to increase the supply. And uh, the other thing we can do is not increase the expense to the developer through a long, laborious process. The more we increase the process, the more the prices go up and um, you know, the costs go up and therefore the prices go up. So I'm in, um, I, I do encourage the piecemeal approach because of that and because of the 15 separate owners, we have pretty much no choice. We gotta get something going. And uh, so no, area, no to area plan and yes to piecemeal. And I also wanna say yes to higher buildings given the nature of the site and in general, it, it wouldn't really cause much of an impact to other people to have higher buildings there. <clears throat> and, uh, um, and I also had a couple little thoughts about the park. Uh, it seems to me it ought to have a lot of outdoor cooking and places for people to hang out in general and lots of benches. And it could, the way to really make it a, ni a nice outdoor living scene uh, that mixed with a lot of plants and trees and it could easily be a really good gathering place um, for especially with the outdoor cooking thing so uh thank you very much good luck oh and i appreciate all your work on it <laughs> thank you and um i'm doing uh jean's what jean would normally be doing but i think she had some technical difficulties and had to drop off uh for the remaining speakers i'll try to hold my finger up at 30 seconds so you if you want to just kind of watch me uh, thank you, Gary, for staying under two and a half minutes. Uh, Rebecca Davies, uh, I'm going to now allow you to speak. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Rebecca Davies, are you there? You're unmuted. Trying to speak. Oh, I, hear, I think I heard you. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. That, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks so much for the chance to speak. Um, I just wanna voice my support for this project and also encourage a real sense of urgency around moving it forward. Um, I live um, in a multi-unit building at 33 South Boulder Circle. Um, it's been a great experience. Um, I've rented in this, this building in particular, it's my fourth year here. I'm, I'm going to have to move because the owner of my unit is selling. And um, you know that gives me a lot of anxiety because now I know I have to find a new rental in Boulder and it's competitive and then it's, you know I'm afraid it's going to be you know a higher rent and and all those things that that so many other renters experience kind of annually and I just ask that this planning board feel that same sense of urgency that we do as renters every time we're stuck in a position looking for more housing and knowing that there's just not enough in Boulder. Um, so I highly encourage a sense of urgency around this project and recognizing that it's a great opportunity to bring more housing to Boulder. Um, I also support um, some of the points made by earlier speakers um, around um, making this you know, a more efficient process so that it doesn't increase the expense to the developer, which is then passed on to um, occupants. Um, and also you know, considering height exceptions and parking reductions to really maximize the potential for this um, for this property to provide more housing. So um, uh, I also wanted to mention, you know, uh, just seeing the plans for it and its location, um, you know, it really has, it's, it's, it's wonderful that it has the aspects of walkability and retail nearby. That's something that, that my development doesn't really have. Um, and, you know, I wish 
I wish did. So um, I think those are great assets and, and why not take advantage of it now while it's, you know, the opportunity is sitting right there. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, the next uh, speaker up uh, is David Adamson. Uh, you should be able to unmute now. Hello, wonderful members of the planning board. Thank you for your service. And I want to say thank you to the developers who are working to um, uh, help solve our housing needs. I'm David Adamson, Goose Creek Community Land Trust, who is um, excitingly uh, going to start building, Lord willing, in September, Boulder's first all natural, organic, 100% fossil fuel free transportation and 100% affordable mixed income co-op in the heart of Boulder. And I, I bring that up, obviously, to uh, help uh, get some beautiful people to come and live there. But um, I'm also trying to console my friends, Gary Sprung and Evan Fryrick, who despair about our ability to solve our housing issues. And um, there is a, a beautiful example of how to do it in our beautiful open space program. You can't solve our housing problems by having a large public market in land, which will only provide the this, this scarce resource to the highest bidder. So we, we just, as a law, we, we must do a lot of land banking and or promote community land trusts, which take land out of the speculative market. That's a huge piece of the cost of housing. And if you combine that with a focus on providing mostly for sale housing to our working people, mostly with car share, which dramatically reduces costs for people, and these new green buildings make utilities very cheap, we can create a lot of modest for sale housing and create great neighborhoods, reduce our climate impact, and, and have a, a, a very vital business sector um, in the developing and then in these neighborhoods. It, it, can, it can relatively easily be done. So that um, is, is part of it. But another part of it is my urgent ask here at the Diagonal Plaza um, and throughout the town is to first think about how we can help um, the beautiful people like Britt, who's a vivacious, eloquent, spirited musician and a new employee at Whole Foods at Table Mesa. Her husband's a plumber in Boulder. So they, they both drive up here every day, an hour plus out of their day, breathing bad air on the highway and creating bad air for the rest of us. And they're only able to get a house in Globeville down in Denver because the family selling the 140 year house who'd owned it in their family since then, resisted all the investors and all the people, you know, offering more than the asking price because they wanted to help a working person. So let's have the city of Boulder do the very same thing for all of our land that's remaining available instead of more super expensive luxury townhouses that are sprouting out to multifamily units everywhere. <laughs> let's Think about what they've done at Fobon or Valbon in Freiburg, Germany. They show how we can have it all. Mountain views, you know, an exciting, rapid health and climate supporting end to private fossil fuel transportation and durable housing, affordable housing for everyone. Thank so you. I could give thank many you. more examples of these. We're, we're at uh, three minutes now. So if, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Uh, excellent. So, um, Let's see, uh, G-Man, you are the only person left with a hand up, but we weren't able to hear um, you or, or you, weren't, you did not unmute. Uh, so unfortunately, if I don't see you unmute, we'll do a last call for hands. And then what I'll do is I'll hand uh, the host function. Um, I don't think that Jean, Jean must have had a real- uh, I am back on. Oh, you're back on. So I'll hand yeah. the host function back to you, Jean. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, while I'm doing that, um, I would invite the applicant to please uh, feel free to respond briefly to anything that you heard uh, during public testimony. David, I see one more hand. Um, oh, did a hand go up? There's a Chelsea. Oh, Chelsea Castellano has uh, raised her hand. So let me allow to talk. 
and then I'll hand over that capability. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, hi, I'm Chelsea Castellano. Um, I um, am a sustainability professional at a federal lab um, on the board of a local transportation um, organization. Um, and I'm also an organizer of Bedrooms Are For People. Um, and so I um, am here to- oh. I'm sorry, Chelsea, I just hit the wrong button. Can you start? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. You, you, uh, we probably lost three or four words. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to essentially support um, building more housing on this site and not um, going forward with a, a large arduous process um, to doing so. I think the outcome of that process would be to build more housing on this site. And I think we all know that. And so I definitely, I don't wanna use a delay tactic to prevent um, housing from being built now when it, you know, we really needed it yesterday. We needed it 10 years ago. Um, Kurt, you know, saying he was on a, a committee 20 years ago to, you know, work on this is, it's sad, it's disheartening. Um, and you all have an opportunity to make this better for everybody. Um, I, you know, definitely support increase, you know, maximizing the amount of, of housing that we can have on this uh, property. And I also just wanted to note something that I think is really exciting that um, President Biden's American Jobs Plan calls for an end to policies that prevent equal access um, and, and economic prosperity to all. Um, and part of that plan, um, makes it so that exclusionary housing laws um, could disqualify our city from receiving federal funds. And some of, I wanna list off the things that are listed in this plan um, that could disqualify us. So essentially not increasing the percentage and absolute number of units, authorizing high density and multifamily zoning, eliminating off street parking requirements, establish, establishing density bonuses, um, streamlining or shortening permitting processes and timelines, removing height limitations, um, and established an, uh, establishing by right development uh, defined as the elimination of discretionary review processes when zoning standards are met. So as you can see, a lot of the items that are listed as being exclusionary in Biden's plan are pretty uh, embedded in our city's process. And so I think this would be a really great opportunity to take a step forward, try to make our city and community less exclusionary and really show, show that, that we are not that way um, and, that, and that we want to welcome a diverse set of people into our, into our community and, and embrace them and let them live here um, prosperously. So thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Chelsea. Oh, great, Jean, you've got your moderator position back. I do, okay. <laughs> um, just wanna, I, it looks like G-Man is unmuted, um, but we can't. I, 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 uh, oh, really? Okay, great. We can't hear. So G-Man, if you are there, please go ahead. Actually, I'm um, talking for minute, but still muted. Um, that's been the way it's been since we, Okay. Loud, so I don't. All right. Think, yeah. All right. I see no other hands now. Great. So now, um, or thank you for every everybody for those uh, comments. Uh, Bill, would you like to respond then to the things that you've heard? Sure. Just a quick handful of clarifications. Um, so first, Jarvie, can you respond to whether or not the site is for sale or for rent? Just because that came up, so the market rate product. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I'll clarify quickly. The, the, the proposed plan is a for rent uh, property, not a for sale. There was a couple comments about Zillow circles and searches, um, which which, un, uh, which don't don't apply. It's a for rent property. Thanks. Um, quick hit on sustainability. Um, as you know, that's that's close to my heart. But with all of the other issues to tackle on this site, we just chose not to spend our time talking about it. Just very br briefly, it is top of mind. We're looking at solar, uh, going to try to recycle the old building. Um, but I would point out that taking the in commuters off the road and the reduction of that um, transportation is the biggest impact we could possibly make on embodied carbon. So, um, or just carbon emissions in general, not embodied carbon, sorry. 
So um, that that change of the commute pattern is probably the biggest sustainability move, no matter what else we do. Um, quickly to Laura, I think there was some question about um, how affordable units tie into market rates. So Laura. Sure, and it really ties in also to what Chelsea was just saying, but I mean, it's a closed loop system and I just wanna be clear about that. And you know, I don't get to, to do this lovely affordable campus if Jarvi doesn't get to go and build the housing that he would be building, which is in that 80% to 100% AMI range. So I think, you know, it's smaller units, more units, affordable at a certain level units, then that begets more units on the affordable, like 60% and lower units that BHP um, works in. So it's important to understand that there's a lot of synergy between these two pieces and um, limiting what Jarvi can do will then um, really impact what we can do in terms of an affordable campus in the center of that site. And then lastly, just about timing, um, just to underscore something that Jarvi mentioned earlier, um, again, it's, it's pretty unusual, but we've never really seen, I've never really seen an owner that is not really motivated to do anything. I mean, we've all seen this property sit fallow for a long time. So um, the, there are, there are you know, obviously uh, requirements within any purchase contract and Jarvie would understand it better than I. But the timing of this uh, becomes pretty critical and we have an opportunity now um, to do something. And, uh, just personally, I've been waiting for this, this particular parcel to have an opportunity to do something to it for a long time because it's the one parcel that can make all this work. So um, we are uh, trying to figure out a way to make all this happen in a time frame that works for the owner. Okay, thank you, Bill. And um, I apologize, uh, we've gone quite a long time without a break. So uh, we appreciate uh, the, pres uh, the public and the presentations, but we'll um, take a quick break before we deliberate. So let's plan to please reconvene then at uh, uh, 8.55, uh, about 12 minutes from now.
Okay, it looks like we're at 55 after the hour. Let's see if people are rejoining. <clears throat> Hi, Lupita. Beautiful background. Hey, Georgie. That's my garden. Ah. Can't wait to get the colors out. Just later in the year. Yeah, that's on my list to do some trimming and stuff tomorrow. And it's going like crazy. Hi, Lisa. Okay, I think we're all back. Excellent. So, um, yeah, there have been two two key issues posed, and um, I don't think we probably need to display them because they're pretty easy for me to read and for us to discuss, and that way we can see each other. Um, I think it will be good for us to go ahead and use the two key issues to weigh in. Um, I think with this kind of a format, with concept review, it makes sense to just go ahead and give everybody a chance to speak, and then uh, if people want to take a second pass at it, that's fine as well. Key issue one, um, is, is, is there policy direction within the BBCP to support mixed use and higher density residential uses through, through potential land use change and rezoning on the site? So in this section, I think we should um, look at uh, our opinions on certainly the four, uh, the four options, which uh, zoning options, which are staying BC1, allowing maybe or entertaining the idea to go BC2, uh, uh, MU4, uh, which would be a land use and rezoning or a special ordinance. Those were kind of the four alternatives. Uh, and when we do that, we can talk about our overall uh, perception of whether this is the right, you know, uh, the, uh, the right uh, plan for the site. And then I also think we should each um, discuss what our opinions are about option one versus option two with the additional uh, four story height on some of the buildings. So that would be, those would be kind of the subjects within this section. So somebody would like to lead us off, feel free to do so. Sarah, go ahead. I'm always happy to. Um, right. So um, the, uh, first of all, I wanna pre uh, thank the applicant for their openness to an actual dialogue on uh, what might happen on this very large parcel. Um, so in the staff memo, the reference is made to the need for housing uh, for in commuters. That, that, that's a key um, argument in, uh, in the discussion around higher density. And I will point to the only research that we have that I know of, the 2014 in commuter study, which um, made it pretty clear that um, in commuters are, have basically the same socioeconomic status as folks who live in Boulder. And uh, so they're not, I mean, they match, but not, not perfectly, but uh, the range of, of um, incomes uh, and family types. And that those in commuters, um, like people who live here are looking for a range of housing types. Um, so from my perspective, the, the proposals that are on the table, uh, the very op various options on the table uh, don't actually serve that broad swath of in commuters. It serves a particular slice of in commute, might serve a particular slice of in commuters, but it doesn't serve a broad swath of in commuters, nor does it meet a whole bunch of the housing goals in chapter seven of Boulder Valley Comp Plan, and including I'll just list them, 706, mixture of housing type, 709, housing for a full range of households, 710, balancing housing supply with the employment base, and 716, uh, market affordability. Um, also in the in-commuter study, what was made clear is that people, families with children are not interested in um, uh, apartment rentals, they're interested in uh, homes or townhomes where they can purchase uh, the home. So from my perspective, the task in front of us would be to figure out if there is a, a zoning change that might um, produce the kind of um, housing mixture, the, the type of dwelling mixture that could serve a broad uh, range of needs. Um, so um, 
my personal interest would be a discussion around, um, could we come up with an, an RMX2 style uh, zoning? That's what the holiday neighborhood is, which included a 40% density or density bonus in exchange for 40% of the housing on site being permanently affordable. And it has a mix of rentals and uh, for sale. Um, and I realize this would be a, could be a challenge, but I think it might allow for um, the kind of uh, density and intensity and housing diversity that might really uh, leverage this very large property. So I'm just putting that out there for discussion. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, who would like to go next? I'm glad to do it if uh, if no one else wants to jump in. So, um, um, Sarah, that I um, you're you're very eloquent in, on that topic, and um, I also um, I feel that if we did have the luxury and the time and were able to do an area plan for this, uh, I think that I would be very much wanting to uh, have a section of the property be RMX2 uh, and uh, uh, the, the, you know, the advantage that can be done, I think with, you know, a larger scale planning. Um, the, I guess the, the constraints are that when you, when you do things without that kind of a, <laughs> a thing, then it becomes like, oh, are we singling out this particular uh, you know, they, they're penciling out their, their opportunity and are we singling them out to try to do something that we, we need to really be kind of looking at some legislative ways to kind of make outcomes maybe less slanted towards uh, the smaller uh, units. Um, and I think we'll be talking about that over the next year or two. So um, I, I um, but I, I think it would be great if we could find some, of, some more diverse housing in, uh, but when this comes back for site review, I'll just say that. Uh, the, um, can I ask a question, David, just to follow yeah, go ahead. Just, um, we can have a little colloquy. <laughs> I'm just sort of curious, any of the, anything that's not BC1 is going to require a process. Yes. Um, so, uh, and I, and I don't think I was saying that all of Diagonal Plaza has to become, that this has to be a a, applied to Diagonal Plaza, although that would be awesome. Um, but I, so I'm just trying to put that out there. That's, that's, I'm not, it's not about the whole diagonal plaza. I understand. I, I wasn't trying to uh, imply that. And I, I was kind of um, saying that that would be a world that we could exist in potentially that might open a little more doors to that. Um, so let, you know, that said, I did want to just say that from my perspective, this is a very attractive proposal. Uh, for a site that we've been really waiting a long time to see a proposal for. Uh, and so um, when I look at it, um, uh, you know, and I don't want to discount the, the desire for uh, more mixed housing types by doing this, but I did want to say with my perception that this is a pretty darn good uh, way to be going for this site, given its place, that I would um, then say that uh, and I'll just go ahead and lay it out very quickly going through each one and then we can loop back if we want to. I don't want to take up too much time since I'm speaking second. But I would say that um, uh, that uh, the uh, four story option is perfectly reasonable uh, given its location uh, and given that we'd be get, getting more housing, which we need. Um, I think that uh, staying BCC one you know, I, I think that it would be very interesting to see whether we could actually do a project like this, <laughs> uh, but it does seem like there are challenges uh, with being able to uh, get around the open space requirements and um, it, it, uh, there, could, there could be a path forward there, but, um, but I think it, it would be preferable if we could find a way to go to BC2, but I understand that also comes with, um, we have very rigid restrictions on rezoning. And, uh, and uh, I, I think that, that it's, uh, it, it causes problems when we have situations like we're in here where we wanna do something a little bit creative and we find that we can't <clears throat> make any of the six or seven uh, criteria for rezoning work uh, well. Uh, but, but I think you know, either of those are, are possible um, to, to try to get to what we're seeing here. Um, that 
I mean, of, of course, it, it would be really ideal to actually be able to uh, to pick a, a land use and a, and a zoning that would uh, would make this um, that would that would provide this particular plan um, a, a, a more logical fit. And so um, I just am concerned about the amount of time that that might take. Uh, so, um, and a special ordinance for this site, that's always uh, interesting to think about. Um, it would, I assume it would be kind of like the University Hill has a uh, special ordinance uh, treatment in our use tables where we have all these lines that are apply only to the University Hill neighborhoods in these zones. And uh, so we'd have that kind of thing. Um, the, I mean, it's good because it wouldn't be a non-conformant because it would be clearly uh, specified in Title IX, but, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it gets, you know, it's not the most elegant solution. So I suppose the most elegant solution is probably the one that would take the longest <laughs> and be the heaviest lift, which is uh, doing a land use change and rezoning. Uh, if there were a land use change and a rezoning, I also am warm to the idea of uh, being able to maybe not make it a single zoning district, but uh, maybe try to pick zoning that would cause the business facing stuff to face outward on the streets and uh, maybe cause, uh, you know, have higher density residential in places where we want it. And then maybe even pick a little place where we could do RMX. But uh, <clears throat> so maybe something other than just a single crop of MU4 might be possible. All of that said, um, I'll just wrap it up, uh, wrap up, wrap up this round by saying I just don't want perfection to, our, our desire for perfection to uh, cut off an opportunity to uh, to do something with this that we, you know, we've really been waiting for this for a long time, and it and it is uh, horrible to look at that uh, parking lot out there right on uh, the, on 28th. Anyone want to go next? Peter. Thank you, Sarah. I like that creativity around uh, the diversity of housing. Um, similar bouts with the idea of holiday here. I also agree with David on height working here. And I already commented on the transportation or the connectivity plan on the streets that I like seeing. And I want to see even more of that at site. Uh, I like the U-shape facing the uh, uh, 28th in the mountains. I think that's gonna be a, a nice place. And I wonder about the, the affordability here and how to balance that with the single family home need. It seems like we come, we come back to this a few times. And so I'm still stuck on how to get uh, the diversity at this site and then it's so hard not to just look out across the rest of the entire site and then want to see that come into focus so uh, that's not where we are but I am I do believe that this will be a catalytic uh, opportunity for this site and I like what I see so far so I'm going to pass on my comment time to someone else and maybe come back around specifically to the points later thanks all right, Lisa. Um, yeah, so I also thank you, sir, for those comments. Um, and I like I liked the creativity too. I always get a little frustrated with the tools we have available and the things we can and can't do, particularly around zoning. Um, but you know, the idea of having some kind of density bonus to trade uh, for things we want when looking to existing neighborhoods that we like the results on and also just thinking about how busy that corridor is, is very appealing to me as well. If, if we had a means to do so, or if we can find one. Um, so I think I would also say that this is such a large parcel on this site. Um, and I think overall moving in a very good direction, although we'll, I'll have some feedback later for ways that I think it could be even better, um, that I'm not concerned, you know, by it just being a piece of the parcel. Um, I think, you know, very appropriately we apply zoning and, and we try to look at things as we can, but as we heard from some people, you know, we we haven't applied urban renewal to this. We haven't used some of the tools that we have available. And, and I don't want us to miss out on something as strong as I think this is um, because we wish that we could do something differently when it's just not available to us at this time. Um, and then also I wouldn't, 
argue for this as a um, <laughs> general rule, but historically cities have been, you know, created piecemeal, you know, people build what works for them at the time in the space that it works. Um, and sometimes you get some interesting results. I won't call it specific uh, cities, but modern results like some cities in Texas. Um, but sometimes you get some really beautiful examples that are, are just kind of a lived environment. So, um, you know, we, we have a lot of control still over this and I'd, I'd like to see it move forward. Um, I'm also okay with higher heights, particularly if we're able to exchange it for um, affordable housing, if we're able to exchange it for um, stuff that is more toward middle income, as expensive as middle income has become in uh, this city and on the Front Range in general, particularly in last year. Um, and then I also just wanted to call out staff's points around um, open space. And I thought there were good questions about like how open space gets counted and like all of that, which I thought were, were very valid, but I did like kind of linking it together and providing those through ways and finding ways to make uh, open space be continuous, um, I thought was very appealing. And then also um, where we place the parking and you know maybe putting some solar above the parking um, and incorporating as many green features into it as well. That's something else that, that personally for me um, makes more density, you know, more appealing if it's very green. So those are some guiding thoughts for the next phase. Great, Georgie. Yeah, um, I, I agree with a lot of the thoughts that were that were presented, especially uh, Sarah's around diversity of housing. I, I wanted to make clear, at least from my perspective and what I heard from the developer tonight, that um, there are no plans for, they have no plans currently for any for sale component of this. And I believe the reasoning behind that is because of the opportunity zone carrot that's out there and the ability to bundle this whole project and sell it, flip it down the road. And so we need to be, we need to understand as a planning board that at the end of the day, that this is, that is most likely what will happen and they will maximize the rents on this site with that motivation. Um, and the term workforce housing is um, according even to Bill and the developer is something that is there's no definition for, no parameters for in, in our city. Um, interestingly, the developer also said they're targeting an AMI of 80 to 100%. And so I'd like them to put their money where their mouth is and figure out a way to hold them to that 80 to 100% AMI in some form or fashion, either through design criteria or other things that really makes this project affordable for the middle income that we're looking to solve for beyond just the affordable housing that uh, we're talking about. If we were able to do that, I would be completely in favor of um, bonus density or height around those things. Um, and, you know, just, just as a, you know, 80 to 100%, 100% AMI, I think is around 100 to $110,000. Um, if you compute sort of, you know, someone should be having a third of their expenses go toward ho housing or less. Um, we can impute sort of what those rents should look like um, and divide that up into unit types and really understand whether or not that's something that's going to happen here and not just take people for their word. Um, because my, my gut is, is that um, as, 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 as pure the motivations are to make this a community space, it will ultimately be bundled and flipped to investors outside of this developer, especially with the opportunity zone as a carrot. So um, those are my two cents. Thank you. Lupita. I so much enjoy listening to my colleagues because they all always bring very valid and diverse perspectives and important points that really help me think more after all. Because one of the areas where I'm most concerned about this project or any project for that matter is is how we're going to uh, uh, provide um, opportunities for all kinds of people to live here, including families. So um, it, it is the kind of thing that even in the in the way that we design new housing that will be for sale versus for rental. And in this case, as Georgie just mentioned, you know, if it's going to be all for uh, for rental, then certain people will automatically say, no, I'm, that's not going to serve the needs 
um, like Sarah mentioned earlier, families want to have space or even if it's a tiny space around the house, but they want to own something. So one of the things that I would like to encourage the applicant and even for us to keep in mind is, it's not just price, but also the type of population that we want this city to have. And, you know, I, I, I happen to live in South Boulder where we do have some families, but I go to many places around the city where it really is just older people. And I do call myself older and or young people, but not real families, you know, because I don't call a person with an animal a family and my definition of it, I call usually children, you know, going to school because if that constitutes a more complete vision of what a city should in the service that it should provide. So all I wanna say is with regards to the pricing is one thing, but also the type of housing that we should be seeing and approving really should reflect on the kind of family types that we would like to see. And, you know, and, and I understand we have some people speak about earlier about, you know, a 50 something is not a retired person, um, but still a single person is not a, a complete family. So I'm concerned about having, you know, access to families like Sarah mentioned that will want to live here and they have the space to raise their families. I think, I don't know how we can, how can we bring that conversation back in here? Because I really feel that oftentimes we miss the boat with this particular part. So I just wanted to go on re record on that one. Thank you, Lupita. <clears throat> um, great, great comments all around. Um, does anyone want to take a second uh, pass at this? There's um, in the set in key issue two, we're going to talk about feedback on the conceptual site plan and architecture. So there'll be a lot of interesting things we can just say about the plan. Um, anything more anybody wants to say about the rezoning options and, and stuff? Because that, that's, I think that um, staff and applicant would love to hear anything, any opinions people have on that. And I, I tried to summarize mine. Sarah. So I, it's really interesting to hear everyone's comments. And um, what I heard Elaine say was uh, that the, re, the rezoning, um, the, dem the applicant has to demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that the proposed rezoning is necessary to come into compliance with the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And that, that if I understood Elaine correctly, that was um, a um, mark against going from BC1 to BC2. I, I think that's what I heard her say. Was that correct, Charles? Yeah, I think that's correct. Unless we start talking about um, a comprehensive plan land use change, in which case then um, we would change the land use um, and then apply zoning that is consistent. So for example, um, you know, if we were interested in RMX2, then we would be looking at a land use plan change um, that involved um, uh, RMX or mixed use residential. So, zoning. so any, any of these options requires some process is that am i understanding that correctly that's accurate yeah okay so the the requests we got from from the public to bypass process is not actually an option <laughs> it's going to take processes that's a fair okay so um and with with the mu4 if i'm understanding correctly that would produce the d the density of or intensity of development of the transit village. Is that also correct? That's correct. Okay. So um, um, if we have to go through process anyway, um, I think we should try to be as creative as we can in the recommendations that we offer that could, could um, meet multiple needs this is a i mean i that's i was stunned yet today when i went over there how big this site actually is i mean it's gigantic it's lit it's gigantic um and just just the parcel forget the rest of diagonal plaza i mean it's huge and to me that suggests that there are ways to be really creative about 
uh, about what we can get out of this um, and to use, I think it was Evan who used the term leverage. I mean, I think we could be able to, we might, there must be some leverage points that we have that could move us forward on a lot of the different um, elements of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. And maybe that's um, additional height on some spots and um, family type housing or diversity of housing on other spots. Um, uh, maybe we have to think about um, uh, coming up with a way, I know that getting a developer to produce for sale housing is more complicated than just rental housing. But um, given the current economics, if you have to pay $3,000 a month in rent for a three bedroom, you're just more likely to just go to Longmont and buy a place. So how can we, what can we do? What guidance can we give that might produce a parcel that's for sale or a housing on part of the parcel that would be for sale. And maybe there's some sort of a covenant that's created that keeps those, those for sale properties in the, in the missing middle price range. You know, we've, we've got a couple of covenants like that um, in the city and I'm, I'm not trying to make process. I'm trying to get to outcomes that meet a lot of the needs that we have. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I certainly, uh, when I went through the uh, relevant uh, criteria in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, I could see how, you know, the proposal does meet uh, a lot of those, and uh, and uh, and that really argues for, you know, and uh, certainly the mixed use development is is really the most important, th you know, the thing that we really want to see for this site. So um, it's just that with you know that rezoning criteria to go from BC one BC two, for example, it's just uh, if it, it's a little bit hard to say that it has to be done to comply, right? So uh, so it could um, it would have to uh, be be kind of creative even to do that. Um, I think that yeah, that, that um, I agree with you. If we could have some creative solutions in the rezoning process, I think that certainly um, when you're dealing with this kind of a situation, the the owner. Has a lot of <laughs> a lot of say since it's kind of being requested from that that side. So, uh, but um, I think I think it's really important for for us to say these things and for hopefully people are listening. Uh, Lisa. And then I think Lupita had her hand up um, shortly after I came up. Um, I can go after you. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, uh, I am speaking for myself, and I don't have the relevant sections of code pulled up, so I don't think I can speak for the rest of planning board on this. But like. Things I would love to see there, you know, would be if we could, maybe we're not getting single family homes, but we're getting townhouses or something that would be more appealing to families in addition to um, some apartments, in addition to um, some affordable housing. Um, I would love to see, and I know it's gonna push the price up and I'm not excited about luxury, but maybe we can trade off on part of the parcel for something else on another part of the parcel. I'd love to see parking pushed underground. Um, I know it's expensive, but I'd love to see that not service um, or some of it not service and more of it under. Um, you know, th those are some of the things that if I kind of saw them coming forward, um, you know, again, I, I, I think the, the bar that we have to hit to change zoning is, is tough just because of how it's written. Um, but those are the kinds of things that, you know, maybe would allow us a little more leeway. If we could say, oh, look, we're getting all this additional whatever, because we, we've been able to take some of the surface parking and push it under. And now we've got some more expensive units, but we also got some townhouses that are going to be, you know, really appealing to some families. And in addition, we got a little more affordable housing. And, you know, um, those are things I'd love to see that might, depending on how you can structure it and the cost of everything and how you price things might also be beneficial to the developer. So um, just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, Lupita. Um. Yes, in fact, I I, I always uh, like listening uh, your opinion, uh, David, and then and I, I was wondering uh, also uh, what Georgie's opinion was regarding you know what uh, Sarah um, put forth because of the idea of multiple you know or types of housing it came up already and the um, applicant considering just to try different architectures in the sense that 
it, it, it really bring beauty into the city. One of my biggest concerns about the city is that every time that we work on a project, we tend to focus on optimization for that one particular site. And we don't think about optimization for the city. And I think we're gonna pay the price for this. And then years later, they're gonna point out to us, you know, and the board did this and the board did that. And of course, just like we hear things that should have happened years ago and they didn't. So one of the things that I, I like to think is if we can just move a little bit on that direction, how will that uh, help us get, you know, a better site in the sense that if we were to consider some of the, you know, for sale housing that will force for example, not too far from there, we have people living in our most affordable housing in town that will be make that available. Um, sort of like what we saw happening and transitioning now over at Ponderosa, where we're moving, you know, housing from, you know, like the mobile homes into actual permanent housing. I would like to even hear uh, your your opinion on something like that, because this is where literally we could be doing a better integration of our community instead of living and continue to live and continue to promote this segregation. This city is very segregated. And I, I'm embarrassed when I talk to people because I do say it that way. Um, we gotta be proactive about these segregating people in this, in this, in this city and thinking where this parcel is, this will be a prime opportunity to try to do some of that. And I, I don't know how best to kind of get that conversation other than to look at the different elements that are possible there and see, given that we also have, you know, um, Boulder housing nearby that this may be just sort of like the bridge for doing some of these things. I just wanted to put that there, maybe, and maybe see what Georgie thinks about this. Georgie, you wanna weigh in on that? Sure. I mean, I I I, I agree with you. Actually, what I support what Lisa said too, because I think that that comes into play, where you know when you're talking about diversity of housing, you know the diversity of the 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 demographic in there too might actually be beneficial to the developers so that they can support some of the other things that we're trying to accomplish there. Um, I don't know what zoning mechanisms are available to us to handle that, and we might need to get creative, especially if we can be expedient around that process. But um, I, I, I support what you're saying. And, and I think in it's similar vein, it sounded a lot of what Lisa said too. Um, so um, I don't want to put words in your mouth though either, Lisa, but, but I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And of course, um, I'll just say, you know, if, if we can, if, if the city or a nonprofit partner can purchase the property, of course, that opens up all kinds of doors. And, uh, you know, so that, that isn't always what we see before us. Uh, so um, that, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I totally, I totally hear what you're saying. So um, why don't we go ahead and um, move on to key issue two and we can uh, weigh in on uh, any number of aspects of, the, of what we're seeing in this proposal that you, we'd like to talk about. And um, again, I'll just go ahead um, and uh, let people raise their hands when they want to speak and uh, we'll go around. Anyone want to go first? I'd be happy to if no, there are no other takers. Usually, usually the chair likes to go, you know, go last if uh, if people want them to. But I, I'm glad to go first. Um, so, um, you know, just some of the issues that we'll be looking at, um, assuming that this, uh, you know, I think this is an appropriate uh, sized uh, solution for this property. Um, if it came to to us uh, and could be. Uh, uh, you know, work with the zoning. Um, I think that I would be very warm to flexibility on ground floor areas where residential could be used instead of commercial, um, as long as we had, you know, commercial along some of the major arteries. Uh, because I think that we're seeing um, in this, these economic times with, with COVID and everything that uh, it's, you know, there may not be quite as much demand for ground floor commercial. So, uh, so I think I saw some, some, uh, 
signals that there might be some requests to override that in a couple of places and that you know we'd be getting residential so i think that would be acceptable um the location uh is um oh let me talk about the workforce housing thing um i think it's really appropriate and uh to point out um you know the things that are <laughs> the kind of sell things do make it into uh, all the way through into what we see and i think it was very uh, appropriate to catch that uh we, we were um you know we've had some times where there's supposed to be public uh rooftop uh amenities that uh tend not to be so public in in implementation for example so we know that um that, and so it's good for us i think to identify things that maybe uh you know we're putting our best foot forward but it, it, it there is nothing in criteria base that would keep things affordable outside of the affordable housing units that said uh there have been some interesting things tossed around here and so you know maybe the applicant would like to uh, think of ways uh that they could condition their own site review that might kind of uh, you know uh, we had a recent one with marketing materials uh you know maybe maybe there could be a, con a, a condition that you could kind of recommend and work out with staff that would kind of keep the cost of the units under control with their design uh that they're not designed as as a high-end units so that's just something to think about um the uh the transportation opportunities are fantastic here i love the new corridors i love all the street facing stuff um, I have to admit, I am a 24 hour fitness member who hasn't used their uh, membership all year. Uh, so I bike through there all the time. And there, that, that crossing at 28th Street to the west um, is very highly used by all types of bikes and pedestrians. We've got really great paths to the north, to the northeast. And I think I just saw one to the south that I didn't even know about. So um, as we, as these proposals come through, really good bike uh bike and pedestrian uh permeability uh using the tmp as a guideline will be very much welcome um not too concerned about displacing walgreens there's another one at walnut and 30th and uh i'm sure walgreens can find places um i don't think view of the corridor uh protection is a big issue here which is kind of nice so i do think that uh um, again, the height standards uh, should be uh, loosened um, more, tw uh, you know, to in a, in a rational way, maybe go above 35 feet in certain areas. And I, I would uh, also say that that would make sense for better shaped roofs, though we don't get all those flat roofs. So I'm, I'm really warm to that. I know that DAB uh, will be critical, I think, uh, for this. It's a big enough project that Design Advisory Board will have a lot to say. So I'm really hoping this goes by DAB. And um, I do agree with staff's concern about buildings six and seven, or maybe it's five or six. I think it differed in a couple diagrams. Uh, the two affordable uh, buildings, um, I really would like to see the uh, uh, green space around those addressed as, um, so they're not surrounded on three sides with pavement. And oh, I'll just say the climate action point that uh, a member of the public made uh, and that the applicant responded to, yes, we will look at that and look for that at site review time. So thank you. Uh, all right, that was a lot of words for me, Sarah. Um, so I I want to speak to uh, I am I think the um, transport the uh, internal grid solutions that are proposed are are really positive, uh, and lay the groundwork for um, future development that is not on a massive scale by breaking that that it not. Um, this proposal doesn't eliminate the um, uh, transportation network that was proposed 20 years ago by the panel that um, Kurt was on. I think that's great. Um, uh, it's a little hard to comment on the architecture and site plan when it's as vague as it is. Um, and we don't really have, I mean, I. I feel like I'm looking through a gauzy film at something else Bill Hollicky has built has designed. So, and we know what his what that style is, and it's it's nice. So, I'm, I, but I I am I do feel like the buildings, and maybe this goes back to the challenges of the zoning. Uh, that building uh, number five 
is gonna it's just gonna be massive um and i think it's five the one that's u-shaped um and has the the rooftop deck um that's a very 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 big building um and i'm just cognizant when i walk through tvap for example transit village of how um how um how crowded it feels I, and I, i'm not saying people because i i don't know whether it's rented out yet but as a as a built environment it feels quite um a little overbearing and quite out of um quite different from most of the rest of boulder and i i would hope that um the the design the ultimate design of this very large development doesn't have that same feel um uh and i'm not sure exactly how you fix that but um that's a comment i wanted to pass along i shared david's concern about and the staff's concern about the green space um at boulder housing partners being wrapped around with parking um and would hope that in fact the idea of connecting the two Boulder Housing Partner um, developments through a green space and finding parking um, elsewhere is um, is actually a possibility. And I also um, back to the other buildings. If I understood the drawings correctly, there's a big, huge parking lot inside that U-shaped building, um, which I I couldn't tell if that was. Ground, underground or ground level covered by apartments above it or whether it was an open parking, but it would be nice to have that not be just a big open parking area. Um, and like I said, it's very hard to tell what the architecture would look like because it's it's kind of a vague, it's it's more blocks than than a very particular proposal. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else want to join in on key issue two? Peter. I, I was just thinking of Sarah's comment and thank you, Sarah. That was great. And Sarah and David, both excellent. The, the building size, I can live with the bigger building that's shielded from the road and we're going to get the economy of scale on those bigger buildings for the housing we need without getting into the discussion on ELU versus not and what it's serving but just the environmental impact of larger buildings that are contiguous and going off of that I do want to see more on the sustainability piece I you know, there's microgrid development conversations happening at Boulder Junction and projects like that. I think that if this is to be a catalytic component, laying these, these sustainability pieces here for this infrastructure is something that that's the leadership role this, this applicant should and could take on the site in general. Thank you, Peter. Other comments, Sarah. Second. Pass. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to go before, if other people have comments. Well, if, if, there, if, if there are no hands, go ahead. Okay. So um, I do see from the design, the drawings, that there's um, open space that is uh, man, man, manicured and and designed. Uh, but I I do hope that um, the end result will. Um, to Bill's point about the 14 feet, those tree lawns um, that are designed that he put into the drawings for the road. Um, if there's any way at all to uh, really uh, create, create uh, that kind of tree lawn where the trees are not planted in tree boxes, but are actually free range trees um, and can really survive for longer than a few years and really address heat island and um, creating an, a, 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 a urban canopy. Um, I, that would be, I think, ideal. Um, we just, even though we are going, we are proposing to go from nothing but a parking lot to a built environment with some tree, with trees, 
I'd really like us to think about the biophilic component here and try to get in as much green and trees and canopy as we possibly can. Right. I'm talking about those uh, those uh, green space spaces, um, having amenities that encourage uh, community gatherings, uh, you know, flexible spaces where maybe you could have small performances or, you know, uh, gather to have a meal or a meeting or something. It would be kind of interesting. We um, saw, uh, actually, I'm liaison to DAB, and we just saw a really interesting presentation from students about the use of the power plant out at Valmont, Valmont power, power Plant. And they, they um, put a picture of a little amphitheater, and it was just so cool to think about having a little community amphitheater uh, in, a, in a public space. So it's always nice to see places where people can gather. Any other thoughts? Rupita. Yeah, I actually was very, um, um, I don't know, intrigued and actually in a positive way, uh, the idea of bringing the open space in combination with the other housing uh, that is uh, nearby. Again, it has to do with the whole integration within the city, finding opportunities to bring communities together. So that sort of thing I was thinking, we, had, we don't see that very often. Um, and even though it was a little bit, you know, what, I don't know, how, how did that come about? Is it really um, appropriate? Are we following the rules again? Because God knows we have seen enough times that we, we see things and then we know that it's not possible. We're breaking some sort of rule. But if it doesn't, I thought that was a good way. I mean, we are learning, right? <laughs> so, we, God knows we figure out more than once that, you know, we thought we could do this and then we find that we can't. But um, the, uh, the idea of this integration, I think that was kind of one of the positive parts of it. Um, and um, I would like to um, kind of just highlight that part because I would really like uh, this applicant and other ones to see that, at least for me, was a very positive thing. And then uh, other uh, applicants in the future kind of think about how they can really make that, um, you know, kind of connection with what we have there, especially with other communities in a way that is very integrated as opposed to where well, you just happen to live or, you know, build this next door or a block away from it, but literally trying to integrate it more, uh, more effectively. So I just wanted to uh, make that comment about the part of the architecture and the way they were doing with the landscaping that I thought it was good. That's great, thank you. Anyone else want to? Lisa and Georgie, I don't know if you've gone or if you're okay, just kind of letting things ride at this point which is just perfectly fine. I had one more, one more question actually, you know, cause you, you had the, the, the background of the site and I see the beautiful mountains. And I'm wondering for the housing right north of that, um, how much will we cover for the, those, um, those neighbors? at the level of the height that we're talking about, it shouldn't be a problem, right? This is the kind of thing that they do check. Well, I love when, when we ask the applicant to respond, let's, um, yeah, if, if uh, we can ask them to uh, respond to that before we finish here. Um, yes. uh, I'll, I'll just say from my perspective, knowing that site pretty well, um, there is a triangle, you know, to the north between, and then there's a quite a wide uh, section of diagonal highway. So I suspect, you know, the the, Shadow study, you know, all the kind of shadow and uh, and view site studies will will probably reveal that it's uh, that it's not particularly impactful. But um, we can see if the applicants thought of that. Anyone uh, else want to talk uh, before we go? Invite a response. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, everyone. Um, uh, Bill and team, do you? Uh, uh, hopefully, this was useful to you and. Um, if you have any comments on view corridors or anything else you heard, um, maybe you could just chime in before we finish up. Thank you. Yeah, this is extremely helpful and we appreciate the discussion. Um, again, you know, this is what concept plan is for is to kind of throw ideas around and hear what you have to say. And we'll do the same with council and um, staff and the community and um, thank you. So yeah, a few things, maybe I'll take that 
that view quarter question first. Um, staff did have a picture of that in there, and we have looked at that, although we didn't draw it. Um, it shouldn't be an issue, especially because the corner site, which would be kind of in direct line from the properties to the north to, to the mountains, uh, is not in this proposal. But uh, we can certainly look at that, do a rendering of it, see what that shows. But um, with the size of the diagonal and the fact the corner's not in it, I, I wouldn't expect there's any impact whatsoever, but we'll take a look at it. A um, few other comments, and I just made a quick list. So this is gonna be a uh, really scattershot. Um, so uh, Holiday Neighborhood was brought up, and that's a 27 acre site. And this site is eight to nine acres. And when we take out all of the right of way, which is really substantial, especially on the Southern kind of tail part, we're down to around six acres or six and a half. Um, so if you look at the different components of Holiday, which we happen to be familiar with because we designed a bunch of them, um, you know, each one of those components was about that size. So it's not like you could fit a holiday here. You could fit part of a holiday on the entire diagonal plaza, which brings up just one thing to consider when we talk about integrating all these different housing types. Um, you know, I would, I would, I, first of all, I want to say we heard you, we're going to look at it, see what, what can be done and all that. Um, I, I'm not at all pushing back on it. But I am saying that, that maybe just keep in mind the scale and there might be a way to integrate different housing types as the project develops, as the area diagonal plaza develops. Um, if we're using holiday as a model, the size would support kind of different chunks being different things, this being one chunk. Um, so just something to, to kind of think about. Um, so I am, I'm going from macro to micro and back, I apologize. Free range trees um, is my new favorite term. Uh, and we can definitely do that. That's not, that is definitely, we had kind of already planned on that, to be honest, but Sarah, since you bring it up, yeah, I think we can put the trees in eight foot tree lawns so they're not, you know, in holes in the sidewalk. They're actually in um, planting areas or, or turf areas. Uh, we agree with staff totally. And I think you, you also brought it up that we need to do a better job of fronting the park, especially with the BHP building. So we're working on that. Um, some semblance of that was represented in the plan, but we didn't really get into it much, so we'll continue to work on that. Uh, I think I'm hearing, so correct me when I get done if I'm wrong with any of this stuff, but I think I'm hearing that like the idea, and we've actually heard this from other um, stakeholders that uh, like 30 Pearl, where we, you know, it was just kind of a three-story or a four-story box. It was just maxed out as a box. That's not what is being looked for here. Um, some different changes in height, uh, a little less, I don't know, Sarah, maybe, maybe the best way to put it is a little less making it all full. Um, and, I, and I think that's really why there, I mean, if we were to get to the same density as, as Junction Place, 30 Pearl, it would probably be another uh, 150 more units or more. So I think that was intentional. Um, so it sounds like the direction is better. And so we'll try to continue with doing a better job with the architecture. And as, as was mentioned, we don't know what the architecture is yet. So. Uh, appreciate the comments there. Uh, to answer the question, yes, the parking is all hidden inside. None of it's open to the sky. It's all inside buildings. Right now, it's on the first floor, sort of in the middle of the structure, just to answer the question. Um, Lupita, you mentioned integration a bunch of times, and I think others did as well. Um, that struck a chord because one of the primary things we were trying to do was integrate new with the old on the BHP, but also integrate BHP into the market rate. And that was really where the, why the park is where it is, because it's sort of between the two parts of the project. Um, hearing you all talk about it, I think we can, you know, it's just a concept. So I think we can develop that a lot more, both in integrating the park into the existing BHP site and acknowledging that that existing BHP site is a tax credit project. So there's, you know, we can't like, you know, change everything in it. it there's, we have to have a light touch. But I think it can certainly be integrated better into the new, and then we'll really work on the BHP into the market rate. Um, and I think that's my list. If you can just give me a quick second. Um, yeah, I think I think that's it. it does that um, raise up any more questions for the board? And just one last thing. Thank you for all the comments. We, we're, we know there's a recording, so we'll be going back and watching it when I'm not furiously typing notes. It's a lot easier to, to understand. 
Yep, the recordings are usually out by the next Monday, so uh, on, U on YouTube and available on the website. So, well, great. I, um, it's nice to nice to have those uh, that feedback on what we said, and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, it, it sparked a lot of ideas. Uh, Bill, Laura, Ganika, Javi, thank you for your presentation, and uh, looking forward to seeing more. Yeah, and I only have one one final comment, which is, um, you know, this is a odd one because there's a process involved, and so just thank you to staff. Um, very helpful, trying to help us navigate that. And and one thing that you didn't talk about, I just want to put in your heads, is apparently there's already a zoning change coming for BC one under the community benefit clause. So the simplest solution might be a zoning change under BC one. That was one of the suggestions of staff to just modify the open space requirement, everything else in BC1 the site complies with. So apparently there, there's potentially an opportunity to modify BC1 just for this area that would allow under site review, right? Um, planning board would have to see it uh, for something like this to move forward. So that just might be another way that you might see this. Um, but again, uh, as we've learned, um, when I start getting deep into the code, it doesn't work out well because I don't understand it like staff does. So I will defer to staff and we'll try to work through it with them. Yeah, that was the one I was talking about where it would be put in as a specific BC1 interpretation for this particular site. Like we have specific uh, Uni Hill, but you're, you're thinking of a BC1 wide uh, thing or it would just be for this site, right? I, I would defer to staff on that again. Um, well, I'm sure yeah. staff has heard. I've learned better. <laughs> that we have at least discussed all those options so uh, and then really quickly um just any anything else from uh, danica or jarvie or laura that i've missed well sure i just wanted to add that i heard a lot my ears are always tuned into like what the community desires and what the neighbors think and you know there's a lot of people that live in this community and i think you know, spending some time talking to them, talking to the residents of BHP. My kids went to Columbine. So, you know, talking to, you're right, it's a direct feeder. There's a lot of families that live um, in this area. So I just, I wanted to say, I heard you on that. And I think um, as we move forward and talk about what the units are, what they look like, um, you know, how we make this more family friendly, I, I'm, I'm, I hear you loud and clear. And so I wanted to just acknowledge that and um, talk. And I heard Lupita about thinking about the neighborhood as a whole. I worked on Ponderosa for many, 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 many years. And now that that neighborhood's part of the larger neighborhood. And so it's it takes a lot of time, but I, I think it's very important. And so there's certainly through the this process, whatever it is, we'll, we'll take that time and um, work with our neighbors and um, see them as a significant stakeholders. So, and Naropa is there. I mean, there's just a lot of people that we can speak to. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as we move forward. And Bill, I don't have anything more than just to say thanks for everybody's time and feedback. It's, uh, we started with the idea of a dialogue and I think we accomplished that. So we really appreciate all the feedback. Good. And, and likewise, thank you all. Good to hear. Okay. Well, with that, uh, and I, I will also add my thanks to staff uh, as well. Uh, by the, the, I think that there are some really interesting uh, possible ways to go with this. Uh, and uh, a lot of it really relies on, on our very uh, expertise staff. So thanks for doing that. All right. With that, we will go ahead and uh, uh, move on to our matters. So um, we are, um, bye everybody. <laughs> we are uh, going to be um, having an update on CU South, which means that um, two of our board members, um, I assume will be uh, departing. And so there are a couple of things that I wanted to cover uh, before then we start, we do that. Uh, so the first one would be um, uh, the calendar check. Uh, Cindy, did you uh, want to, are you prepared at this point to do calendar check? I am. All righty. Um, I just took a bite of. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's early for that. I know. Uh, so we have a meeting next week, May 27th. However, it's going to be a fun meeting. Excuse me. Um, it's going to be um, 
Boulder Housing Partners is going to be doing a presentation. It's just a, really a study session is all it is. So it's, there's going to be no public um, participation um, as far as speaking, but it's going to be a presentation of regarding affordable housing 101 by um, um, Boulder Public Boulder Housing Partners, excuse me. Charles may have something to add to that um, or not. <laughs> No, I think um, spot on. We'll hear from Boulder Housing Partners, and uh, we'll also have our housing staff available too to talk about um, what that means at um, applying the city's regulations. And it'll be um, it'll be a great lead into our retreat, by the way. So thank you for that. Lupita. Yeah, I a comment. Um, it, I have it on my calendar that it starts at six and it ends at ten. I got that right. Well, I mean. 10 is, is subjective. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yes, yeah, uh, that is correct. It starts at six. Um, I'm not going to be there. Um, I will have a stand in. Um, I'm going to be on vacation, but um, so I won't be there. But um, and then we have, uh, then it's June after that, which I can't believe. And we have a jam packed June. Um, we have a meeting pretty much every Thursday in June, which includes our retreat, which is on June 10th in the afternoon from one to four. So we have a meeting June 3rd, our retreat on June 10th, and we've got a meeting on June 17th and the 24th. And just real quick on the um, retreat, um, uh, I'll just um, give, a, I, I'll, I'll send out, I'll have Cindy send out a, a kind of a quote unquote final uh, agenda for the retreat. Uh, and then we can, we'll have one more meeting where we can bring it up on the third. Uh, but um, uh, I, I did uh, have a meeting with Jacob and uh, Charles where um, the idea of a guest speaker is kind of a budget uh, thing. And uh, I think we'll have more breathing room if we don't do a guest speaker. So we'll talk more about it at the retreat, you know, uh, but um, so that I'll just give a spoiler alert on that. So. I think we'll have a little more breathing room to just talk amongst ourselves. And uh, I, I think that from what I heard from the board, um, most people will be happy with that. And that's it for me right now. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Wait, what's the July schedule? Oh, July, pretty busy. Um, we, allow me one second here, I'm gonna pull up my schedule here because I was doing June off of my memory. And July, we have a recess for the first July date. So July 1st is our technically our recess. So no meeting on then. July 15th is a joint board meeting with TAB, another joint board meeting with them. Um, and then July 22nd will be, we're gonna be discussing CU South annexation. So it's gonna be a full meeting. That's the only topic that night is CU South. Um, and July 29th, we are reserving that in case we run over on CU South, um, because we could very possibly need two nights for that. We're expecting a, a tremendous amount of public input um, at that yeah. public hearing, so we figured we would reserve the meeting after that in case we need to continue deliberations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And what's the mix, what's the combined meeting with Pat? So that there won't be voting on it in that meeting, I take it. Yes, no. in Arapahoe Station Area Master Plan, we're going to be presenting the 60% recommendations uh, for board feedback. That's on the 15th? The 15th, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So just to clarify, it sounded to me like for July 22nd and 29th, um, that the 22nd for sure will be entirely C CU South. And then if the 29th happens, it will also be entirely CU South. Correct. That's correct. Okay, great. Yeah, so I understand Lupita and Lisa, you will be recused for that. Okay, that's what I have. So. All right. Great, okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so one more thing. Um, uh, first of all, we're getting close to 10 o'clock. Um, so are the, um, uh, Sarah, Georgie, Peter, 
Are you okay uh, doing this, uh, the update from Phil um, a little past 10, starting that after 10? You okay with that? I am. Great, thanks. Okay, so the, the only um, other thing I want to do before we um, move on to that is um, I had sent out uh, a proposed uh, recommendation that we might want to consider to City Council. Um, uh, City Council is going to be discussing over the next few weeks the use of uh, rescue funding that uh, is coming to them. And uh, we've had some really interesting observations. Uh, it isn't really right up our alley uh, or in, in our lanes, but, uh, but it is something that since we deal with a lot of housing that we've seen, and that is the protection of our existing residents who are maybe in vulnerable communities or at risk or, or lower income. Uh, so I sent out a proposed uh, wording of something that we could send over to council if people would like to do that, uh, to get them to think about the possibility of, a, of an emergency fund that could be used uh, for basic needs for families. So I don't wanna spend more than 10 minutes on this tonight. So if uh, I'll, I'll bring it up and we can look at it. If people feel really strongly that it's the right thing, or if they'd like to think about it for a couple more weeks, we can just uh, 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 see, maybe we can even agree to do it. Um, I will say that um, I did uh, no, uh, send a heads up to both the housing advisory board chair and co-chair and the Human Relations Board, HRC, uh, or uh, chair and co-chair that we were thinking of doing this and they thought that would be fabulous, even though if this turned out to be a work plan item, they'd probably be more front and center on it than we would, but uh, both of them thought this would be okay. So I just wanna make sure that you knew that I had kind of uh, let those chairs know. Uh, so basically, um, uh, it's, uh, there's, you know, I won't read through the whole thing, but I, uh, I, and Lupita was really the one that kind of triggered me to want to do this uh, because uh, Lupita and I have both been working with emergency with uh, uh, the connector community this year on COVID response. Uh, the connectors are folks from like the mobile home communities uh, who represent uh, uh, neighborhoods that might have special you know needs during during the emergency, and um, we've been exposed to a lot of these problems. Lupita talked about people with their roofs falling in and they just don't have a, a place they can go. We have EFA, which can provide some assistance, uh, but the city could really um, close some of the gaps. And some of the things I, I, that I was thinking of were critical home repair needs, uh, transportation challenges, uh, home rental, mortgage, ta uh, home tax insurance payment issues not covered by existing programs, uh, utility assistance, uh, which could be emergency based. Uh, or, or even um, discounts for under um, for uh, people of lower income, and then childcare needs. So, um, to the extent that this um, package of up to twenty million dollars that we're getting in the rescue plan could be potentially used to start something like this, and then maybe it could become something permanent over time, uh, is something that I think some council members are thinking about. And if we were to send them a urging that they consider it. Um, Hopefully it would it might uh, get a little bit more attention in the coming weeks. So, any comments on that? Any? I'll, I'll put my comment. I, you couched it in, in here, and it's not that I'm not interested in it. I just this doesn't feel like a planning board topic to me. Um, so, with with that, I, I I'm happy to engage in the discussion. But 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 to me, it, this feels like it should be coming from another board and not from us. I just don't think it's. We've got so much to accomplish as the planning board. I, I just don't, I don't see how this is really in our real house. That, that's, that's my only comment. Okay. Yeah, Lupita? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do want to make a comment about this because the reason why I ended up, I ended up in the planning board was because seeing the, the very dire needs in this population regarding housing and, and a lot of the discussion turned out about, this is the affordable housing we have in this town. Well, I, I think it's affordable uh, for some people, but there, I can guarantee you that nobody on this board would want to live in those houses. And uh, one of the things I mentioned to David, I said, if you people really actually sell the houses, how they live, you will say there's something we can do at least to bring up the issue. And so one of the things I learned firsthand was just finding out what it is available for these people to, 
improve the housing quality. And it's not even improving the quality, it's just really making it so that they don't have, you know, snow on their face when they wake up in the morning. Or, you know, God forbid the entire house caves in to them and they don't make it to the next morning. I think that the city doesn't really have something clearly that works because I was referred to the county. The city has a program to uh, support worker um, residents um, with some of the repair costs, but the program is, at least as it did right before the pandemic hit, was managed by the county. And I worked with one of the citizens who was having her roof caving in to, um, into their house. Um, and it turned out that the county basically said the house was condemned. And so they didn't give them anything. So these people who are the poorest people in our community didn't really have anything uh, that they can turn to for support. Now, we spent all this time talking about affordable housing in this board, and we entertain, you know, great programs like the one tonight, you know, people really listening to us and trying to bring in this affordable housing, but it's in a different context. We, we, we have a, a type of a affordable housing that is, is, is really, uh, like I said, the best I can say is none of you will want to live there. And um, I, I suggest that at the very least, we can bring up the, 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 the topic so that the city can do something with it. And the only reason is not because it's part of our purview, it is because uh, the fact that we deal with the words affordable housing on a regular basis, um, I would like us to really know what that means uh, in the context of where the people in this town really do live that they consider affordable because really that's what we have right now. The affordable housing in this town is the mobile home communities. And some of them really are not, in the, in the words of our own county officials, they are condemned. These are condemned housing and people are living in them. And, and that was before the pandemic. You can imagine how much worse things are because some of them, they couldn't afford to even pay um, the monthly uh, payment for the land where they put the houses. And, and I can tell you because I was approached to help people pay uh, for them because the city didn't have enough or they already have gotten some support. And this is what I mean about the integration. We need to bring some compassion besides our brains into this, into this board and think about really how can we make this city, you know, uh, a better city. So I, I I didn't come out with the words. I just had a discussion with um, um, with David because he's also seeing it from now that he's working with the con community connector, so he gets to see a little bit closer what I'm talking about. And so uh, uh, we're not saying we we have to solve these things, but we certainly can raise our voice. And given the time the timeless of this, you know, because there will be some money coming from the federal government. And there is more and more discussion about affordable housing throughout the country now, because now we know it is, you know, the, the homeless problem is one issue. City Council just spent a whole evening talking about that just recently. Uh, but there is the other one about working people who cannot even live in a, in a home that is reasonable. So anyways, I'll just leave it at that. I just would like you to think about it. And like I said, it's not the our responsibility to some extent, but we certainly can be compassionate enough to say, you know, this is something the city should be considering. Uh, and we would just like to, you know, say, we, we, we would like to just join our voices on it and you don't have to do it either. Thank you, Lupita. I, I, I said, go ahead. I have a, a thought. So I'm looking at the Boulder Valley comp plan and it seems to me that there are two Boulder Valley comp plan goals that are related specifically to the components in the letter that have to do with um, the physical housing stock. Uh, I, I can't speak to the rental issues I, and that may be outside our purview, but um, specifically um, 7.08, which is preservation and development of manufactured housing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, wait, where was the other one? Um, 7.07 .07, preserve existing housing stock. Now I realize that what Lupita is talking about our housing is housing that is maybe beyond 
preservation, but I think 7.07 .07 and 7.08 might be a platform for us to, uh, in a letter to council to say, from a planning perspective that has to do with housing, particularly affordable housing, uh, um, and then note these two um, goals in the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, we would like to urge that council consider utilizing some of the funds for, and then, and, and I can't speak to the, the, the list of five things that you had, but certainly it would speak to um, what Lupita was just talking about, which is um, uh, making, these, making this type of housing um, uh, um, uh, livable is not the word you, you use, Lupita, I'm sorry, but um, not condemned, like to bring them back from the edge of con condemnation. Um, so maybe that's a, a way to, to make the connection to the planning work more specific. So I have to say you, you're becoming the, uh, uh, the criteria guru of, of the board. Um, that is such a, um, such a great idea. Uh, and going and finding those uh, those specific ones in the comp plan is is is, is perfect. Um, yes, and and I, I wanted to add to what Lupita said as well. Um, and I'll just um, do a, a very quick parallel. Um, when I work in nonprofits, when we when we acquire donors, we really want to look at retention. We want to keep those people in the loop, right? Uh, so yes, we want to build new affordable housing. But we really want to also make sure that the existing affordable places that we have are protected. And the other thing I wanted to just mention was that my eyes were so opened to the fact that many of these communities are really um, Latino subcommunities, right? The people, these, these are people who, who are all the, um, they, they know all their neighbors and um, this is where our Latino neighbors live and they, they have, uh, they they have extended families and they support each other. Uh, this is a really amazing part of all, our culture that we must uh, be aware of and protect. So um, so yeah, that I, I think that uh, that it, it's just it, and so that's why I thought it was a close enough to our purview because we see housing things that we could tie in. I think it's a great idea, Sarah, to add uh, BBCP justification. And the only th other thing I'll add is that maybe. We could add a little preamble about how we realize that this is uh, not necessarily this board's uh, responsibility, and we're, we're we don't mean to be adding to any particular work plan, but we wanted to, from our hearts, to speak to this in some way. So maybe we could just kind of put that in context. Uh, reactions, Lupita. Yeah, I I think from from my perspective that you know what uh, number one, I appreciate what both you and Lupita just said about you know being empathetic towards these things and I couldn't agree more and I think framing it in the context of the planning board as, as Sarah says um you know I, I think that that resonates with me so I, like you David I thought that that was a, that, that that's a great idea so excellent Lupita yeah if if I would just add one more thing because I have been um I've been going around the country actually from the comfort of my house giving talks around the country via zoom about environmental justice. And I start my presentation specifically, you know, I, I talk about a number of things and connect the dots, but one of the things that I do speak about is how I ended up in the planning board because I, I learned about the poor quality of the housing in Boulder because of my research that I did when I first arrived here. And, uh, and one of the things that I learned early on as a researcher was that perception was was very skewed in that community when people were telling me, I, you know, I asked the questions as a researcher, you know, what, what is the quality of your walls and your roof? And, and people regularly will say good. And I literally will see holes on them. And so that actually has helped my research because moving forward, when I work with other poor communities, I look at perception, what they think and what the researchers think to kind of bring them together. But in this particular community, I thought, you know, I live here and there's something that definitely should be able to do, not through the research part of my job, but certainly as, a, as a, a citizen in the city. So that's kind of like how I eventually ended up in the board, but it really, it, um, to me, it informs the way that I look at this, our job. But in this case, I said, it's not like you always you can do something. Um, and given what we continue to see as an increasing need in the country uh, with our unhoused people and 
the poor who cannot afford it. And with the pandemic, just aggravating the whole situation. I really appreciate you guys being open-minded about this. And thank you, Sarah, for finding the right language. Because I know it's not that far. It's just that we don't necessarily uh, see this connection sometimes. And, and it, it takes sometimes a, a leap of faith to say, you know, there's got to be that connection where these things can come together so we can start closing the gaps in our society between the, the jobs that we get paid for and the, and the jobs that must be done. And so anyways, for what is worth, I, I appreciate you guys listening and, and, and I appreciate David going for it. And hopefully we can move it forward. But anyways, I appreciate it. And then I will be signing off so you can talk about all you want about see you out. Yeah. Well, before you do, um, here, um, unless there are some other comments on this, um, City Council will be looking at uh, funding sources next week. Not, I don't think they're looking specifically at the 25 million, but it won't be too much longer before they will. Uh, so um, I'd like a kind of a unanimous uh, uh, vote uh, to, to if people feel comfortable moving this forward. Uh, Lupita and I could work language in uh, and, um, and it could be sent on in a timely fashion if people are comfortable with that or we could wait until the next meeting to formally approve it. But if people are comfortable uh, with a, <clears throat> a vote to, uh, to, for, um, to have us uh, uh, work in the comments from tonight and just send it on, um, that would be great. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? I feel good about that. Mm -hmm. You're okay with, uh, with us? And maybe what- Do we need to make a motion or no? Yes, please. <laughs> So can I make the motion? Although I don't have it written down, but I, I make a motion that we move forward with our recommendations to city or um, that we fine tune the language uh, to incorporate uh, the specific code that um, or language that uh, Sarah brought up. So I think that's the most appropriate way to go forward. Um, and thank you. Perfect. Uh, do I have a second to that motion? Georgie, thank you. Okay, um, let's just do a hand raise. All in favor? All right, thanks so much. Uh, Lupita, I will um, create a new draft and then set up a time where we can, uh, you're really good at editing. So I, I want you to, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna take 20 minutes of your time. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And thank you, David, for uh, taking the leadership. I really appreciate it. Okay, well, with that, I guess we'll move on then to uh, Phil Kleiser's update on CU South. Um, uh, I assume we have a couple of recusals. Thank I will be recusing myself. Thank you. As will I. Okay. Good night, guys. Okay, bye-bye. And Gene, if I could borrow screen sharing capabilities, that would be, be awesome. Um, I just have just three slides to share. Um, Phil Kleisler, Planning and Development. Sorry, Phil. Hi. If, I should have anticipated that. It's getting oh, late. <laughs> we've had a fun night with Zoom tonight. I got to be Gene for a few minutes tonight. Yeah, that's not easy. Um, you did an be, excellent job, David. It was a lot of multitasking. <laughs> I got it now. OK. Um, Gene, is that coming up as the, um, the main slide? It looks like it. Mine's moving a little slowly. It hasn't appeared, but it looks like it will. Any luck? If not, we can, I don't really need to do it. Um, let's see if it's not working. Maybe I'll just try one more. Um, your screen sharing is paused. Resume share. OK. Ah, there it is. There it goes. Okay. Yep. Um, so we last really quickly, I just have a few slides um, on where we are in the process, what we heard last month and what to expect moving ahead. Um, so we were with the board um, at a, 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 a great discussion on April 15th. Um, and the following week, we visited with council and had a similar discussion. Um, and so um, at the now what we're doing is we are in active negotiations with the university. Um, drafting um, the terms of the annexation. Um, and we're looking forward to releasing those terms in July. Um, we'll also be presenting that to the planning board for its public hearing for a recommendation to council on July 22nd. 
um, and council will take up the item for a public hearing um, and deliberation in early September. Um, Want to just highlight a few of the takeaways from the planning board and council meeting. There was a lot discussed and these are just some high level um, kind of notes that we had from it. Um, in addition to other things as well. Um, there was a lot of discussion around cost, um, particularly around the flood mitigation project and other cost, and to really be able to show that there's an equitable share of cost borne by both, both parties. Um, and in addition to that, overall, um, uh, be aware of how the benefits and the costs kind of interact with each other and balance when we bring the full agreement to the planning board later in the summer. There was a lot of discussion around transportation. Um, you'll recall there was a, a robust Q&A session with the university's traffic consultant um, who is now revising the study based on this board's input and council's input and planning and um, transportation advisory board and, res and uh, community members. Um, and we're expecting that um, possibly uh, later this month um, or actually probably in the early next month. Uh, there was a lot of discussion around the logistics and how we're gonna enforce a trip cap program on the site. Um, and um, a request for staff to really pay attention to addressing neighborhood impacts to traffic. And I think it was Sarah who mentioned that um, it might be worth looking at what it would look like to de-emphasize car traffic along to Tantra Drive as an access point. And I think there was some general agreement with some other board members on that point as well. Um, an acknowledgement lastly, uh, that this is a pretty long-term project um, and we should anticipate that adjustments will have to be made later um, down the road and that we should be also contemplating opportunities for um, future planning, such as Moorhead Avenue, uh, kind of joint planning between the city and the university. Um, a lot of talk around contingencies, in particular, um, ensuring that if the land were sold to another party that was not the city, um, that all the regular regulations would apply as normal and that the annexation would, should be contingent on the flood mitigation project receiving its permits. And so those are all things that I believe we're in agreement with with the university and we're now um, getting into the details on. Um, the board was in alignment and in agreement with uh, staffs and the Open Space Board of Trustees recommendation around open space land conveyance and um, environmental mitigation. And there was also an interesting comment made, I think towards the end of the meeting of um, thinking through if there's an opportunity for the city and the um, university to partner on some research and collaboration in that open space area. And so that, I think it's something that the university is open to and, and certainly worth pursuing. Um, generally supportive of the development standards we're looking at, like building height limits, um, wetland protection standards, and an overall interest in housing and particularly emphasizing housing over non-residential uses. I would say that council, um, in a Council was on a pretty much the same page as planning board on most things, pretty consistent, especially with what I just went through. There were a few topics that they went a little bit farther on. And so connecting campuses are real strong and planning boards talked about this before as well, but ensuring that there's language in there around connecting CU South to other campuses being via different modes of transportation. Um, somebody in a public meeting last week mentioned a ski lift, but we won't, we won't go into that tonight. Um, uh, more information around cost. And so in addition, you know, the planning board identified that um, and the council asked for some more written materials or even a study session to take a deeper dive into that. It's something that as staff we're working pretty hard on and, and we're not quite there yet um, in terms of being able to communicate something out, but it is something we're working on. Council also looked at the university's proposal on, on residential phasing. And so the university had proposed um, phasing in um, an initial residential count of 100 units prior to doing any non-residential. They thought that was a bit low, so we're going to be looking at that. A lot of input around um, paying attention to outdoor lighting, noise, and, um, and kind of quiet hours on the site, particularly as it relates to recreational facilities and taking a look at what the proposal of the, the, the size of a maximum size of a recreational facility is. And I think council, when they looked at the same thing that the planning board looked at, they felt it was maybe a little bit large for the, for the site and as a whole. And so those are some of the things that, that council had input on. Again, moving ahead, we're, we're looking to anticipating if, if we're in agreement on terms and we're at a point of, of, of being able to release it, we will in July. Um, the goal then is to host a community briefing. So this would be like a webinar style 
um, um, event that we would be able to go kind of line by line of the deal points in the annexation agreement. We'd also have an opportunity at that time through Be Heard Boulder to some sort of comment tool, be able to comment on the actual terms themselves. Um, give it a few days for that information to kind of sink in and, and the leadership from the city and the university will host a, a listening session to just hear from the community about what, they, um, what their reaction is to the proposed terms. Um, and all that information will be provided again to the planning board and council. Um, as I mentioned, we are in active negotiations with the university. Some of the topics we're talking about um, over the next um, few weeks include um, the, number, the, the land use mix and the phasing um, of those land uses. Um, we're looking at their design guidelines and commenting on those. Um, we are working on the transportation terms, particularly around the trip cap and some of the other pieces um, while we're waiting on that technical study to arrive. Um, we're doing a lot of work on cost, both at the flood mitigation level and other, other cost as well. Um, we are looking at those contingencies, um, a first right of, right of first refusal. So if the land was sold, the city would have the, the right to um, put an offer in on the property. Um, the annexation contingent on the flood mitigation project. Um, and lastly, um, we are in uh, planning for and have it scheduled um, discussions around conveyance of land for open space and what a comprehensive environmental mitigation program um, would look like on the site and how that would function. Um, so that's my, um, quick, uh, hopefully, presentation. And we got to the tail end of last the last meeting, and it was pretty late. And I think folks were just like, we need a, maybe we need to think about this a little bit. And if you could come back, we'll, um, we might have some other comments. And so that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. Great. That's, uh, that's exactly what you took the words right out of my mouth. We were, <laughs> we, were we were getting pretty tired. And I think, uh, uh, this gives us an opportunity to, I, I did watch the city council uh, meeting of, and I, I agree. I think that the comments were very similar to a lot of the things that were said at planning board. So um, I, I think that's great. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, any, any questions or, or comments people want to share? Sarah. So first, Phil, thank you so much. You're so great at uh, summarizing and presenting it really is just awesome. So thank you very much. Um, so after our meeting, I've been thinking about uh, this a lot, um, and particularly a comment that came from the public about um, the sense that CU is just um, becoming this um, too big to fail entity in Boulder because it's so big and has such impact on housing and um, all kinds of other issues. And I'm gonna put an idea out there that may go absolutely nowhere, but I just wanted to get it out, of, get it out, which is could, is there any opportunity for this to set the stage for a discussion about a cap on the student body in Boulder at CU? Um, maybe a percentage of the total, I mean, I'm just trying to think, They. it's just such a big, it's the 800 pound gorilla and it has such impact on our housing situation and housing prices. We, we've heard similar comments in the engagement um, that we've been doing over the last few months. Um, and we can, we, we're having regular discussions and we can bring this back, these comments back to the team, yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I realize it may go nowhere, but I, it's worth talking about. Yeah, and, and it, it might also be good to ensure that when the university is doing an applicant presentation that they can also, depending on, I don't know how, where this would go with them, but um, getting a sense from their campus master plan that they're undergoing right now, if that's part of the, that discussion. And if they're looking at capacity, we can, we can follow up on that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Other questions, comments? Thanks again, Phil. Looks like, well, yeah, like I, I want to repeat what Sarah said. I think you did a really great job of covering everything. And, uh, you know, the briefing book is, is pretty heavy. So we were looking through a lot of detail last time. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I think that it really, it really did uh, fill in a lot of gaps for us. So I appreciate it. So if there's no questions, then we'll be planning to um, see you again in July. Um, and what we may do 
is, um, you know, we if, I might talk to Charles and see where we're going with this. And if we're doing this engagement and stuff, if um, I guess just let Charles know if you have any questions or reach out to me directly um, in the meantime, if needed. Great, and then we're gonna tag on uh, a, a quick discussion. Um, the, uh, Hella sent an email out on this earlier today. Um, so last year we actually had three board members who were recused on this item. So um, because of that, um, you know, I, 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 Harmon and was chair and Harmon and I uh, were asking uh, what the process is if, if you have a lot of recusals on the board. And uh, so we did a little bit of homework. So um, I think now would be the time for us to consider given the um, Syria, you know, the importance of this uh, issue and uh, the amount of community interest uh, if we were to um, bring, you know, ask the city council to use its, uh, uh, procedure to potentially appoint alternates, and that would be a decision by the mayor, I think. So I'll, I'll let Hella uh, display and uh, uh, give the overview of that process. And uh, I also thought it would be more powerful if the request came from the planning board than just the chair. So uh, that would be the question to ask ourselves. Well, I'm not actually ready to display it, although I'll, I'll look for it. Um, um, oh, I could um, potentially display it. Uh, I don't know if we need to display it or not, um, but uh, would maybe, do you think it's just as easy to talk through it, Tala? Yeah, I think so. So essentially, the, there is a code section that allows alternate board members to be appointed if there's an absence for recusal purposes or sickness or something like somebody has a surgery coming up um, and the request for appointment of alternate board members can either come from the chair or from the whole board as David just stated um, and you would have to find um, that it's necessary to appoint alternate members because you think that you may either end up with a lack of a quorum which would be if it's less than four members present or if you think that you may not be able to take action. And under the charter, to pass any motion, whether it's in this case, the board will make a recommendation, whether it's a recommendation to approve or a recommendation to deny or approve with additional changes to an annexation agreement that's proposed would only pass if, if four members voted the same way. So if, let, if only five board members are eligible on the current board to act on this and, and potentially somebody misses that day because they're sick, there's a risk that the board doesn't get to a four person vote, I guess. Um, and, and that's what this is meant to address. So we wanted to bring this forward to see if the board felt like um, the mayor should appoint one or two alternate board members. And the city council rules establish how the alternate board members are chosen and you essentially go backwards and look at the most recently departed board member and see if they're eligible and available. And if that's the case, then that board mem member would be appointed and then you kind of go backwards in time based on that. I thought, so we already know Harmon is not eligible. And I thought there was something in there about um, reverse uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. if, if two members departed at the same time, there are some years when two members leave, then you you first look at the re and go in refer reverse alphabetical order. So I think there was one year where Liz Payton and um, Crystal Gray Crystal Gray left. So then Liz Payton would be first approached to see if if she has a conflict. And if not, if she would be available. And if she's not eligible, then we'd go to Crystal. You forgot about Brian though. We have Brian first. Yeah, I, I was just talking about- Oh, uh, okay. That, that's the, 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 that's the, the, but we have, two, we have two people who are not eligible, who are recused. So we would need two replacements, right? So it would be Brian and either Liz or Crystal, mm -hmm. assuming 
there. That's, yeah, that's the order we would we would contact them to see if they would be available. And then it could be that somebody is out of town or one of them may also have a conflict potentially. We, we don't know that yet, but, but that's the process that's established in the council procedures on how to determine who's appointed. How often does this happen? Not very often. I remember that we appointed alternate board members a few, a few years back. And there was a time period when uh, several board members were elected to be council members. And it was, you know, of course they were elected in November and new board members are only appointed in March. So, mm -hmm. and we had, we had a big project come through where the board also felt that it, it was important to have a full board. Usually it comes up and it's a project that where there's a lot of controversy. And I'll, I'll also point out that um, actually it's interesting if you think uh, um, all of the board members that would be potential alternates uh, were instrumental in, in working on the guiding principles. So they're very familiar with uh, the landscape of this. So um, their insights during might, might be quite useful to have on this as well. So that's another reason why I thought this one in particular fit that, uh, you know. I have a question just to, to understand how these alternate board members work. So is this project specific or do they become an alternate board member for a period of time or how does that work? How it would only be for that application. And, and in fact, it, it states that you can't serve on consecutive meetings unless it's a continuance of the same item. Is there any reason not to do it? I mean, are there, are there downsides to doing it? Um, I don't really know of any uh, downsides. I just shared a potential motion. Um, I, if, we're not seeing it. Um, if, is, if it may be, sharing may not be working very well. I know Phil was having trouble. <laughs> I think the coverage is good. I think expanded coverage is, is uh, wise. Well, if, 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 you know, I can always just make the motion by reading it um, myself, but yeah, I don't know of any, uh, any, uh, real downsides to it. Um, it would, you know, I think it would, you know, the community would be uh, more comfortable if, if we had a couple additional eyes on it. And, uh, uh, you know, that is because of, because there are so many people watching us. So I, I would say, I think that it would be to our advantage to have that, you know, to have seven people if we can get them. And it is something that Sam Weaver would, would uh, has the final say on. So we ask and Sam, Sam makes the final decision. Well, Isn't that I, right, Phil? No, I'm sorry. Yes. See? I, mean, I don't see it. I don't see why we wouldn't. I mean, that's a lot of negatives, but it seems like we probably should uh, so that I mean, if it's five of us, we've, we, Pete and I have been in this situation before where there were just four of us uh, and it was not a good outcome. <laughs> um, so uh, having just five um, runs a risk of not being able to reach a conclusion on something that is, or a recommendation on something that's really important to the city. Um, so I, I would think wanting to have all, you know, seven people on the, seven people on planning board for, for this particular issue would make sense. Great. Well, sounds like we have three votes at least. Oh, yeah, I agree as well. Okay, let's vote. It makes sense. So um, I'll make a motion that the planning board find that it is ne necessary to appoint one or two alternate board members for consideration of the CU South annexation and initial zoning applications, as the recusal of two of its members may otherwise prevent the board from taking an affirmative action on these applications. Can, we, can we just say two? I mean, go ahead and say two rather than one or two. And just um, so that what we're asking for is 
no. All set that all seven seats be filled. I think yeah. Is that okay, Helen? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sarah. I'm sorry. I agree. Nice. Okay. Any second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, I'll reread it um, since we changed uh, that number. Motion that the planning board find that it is necessary to appoint two alternate board members for consideration of the CU South annexation and initial zoning applications as the recusal of two of its members may otherwise prevent the board from taking an affirmative action on these applications. Uh, Georgie? Aye. Peter? Aye. Sarah? Aye. And I vote aye. So, um, Thank you for that. And uh, I think that unless people want to do a debrief, we could gavel ourselves out for the evening. Gavel away. <laughs> I actually have this really cool background that's a gavel going up. Uh, anything from <laughs> staff before we gavel, uh, Charles? Nothing from staff. Just uh, thanks to uh, Cindy and Jean for working all the technology tonight. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thank you. Good job. I said it was. I thought it was a, a very good night. I, I, I felt very comfortable with our discussion and the way people interacted. Thanks, to everyone, for being productive. Have a great night. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thanks, Gene.